Right. I'll put, we've got that. Um, good morning, everybody. This is the um, uh, the public regional council public transport committee uh, meeting. Um, just to let you know that to remind you that the committee members that the public section of this meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website following the meeting and archived for a period of three years. I also remind all present that local government decision making affords no protection to councils, councillors, council officers and the public for comments made during meetings that are subsequently challenged in a court of law and determined to be slanderous. With that sober note, uh, I'll uh, open the meeting and um, um, call for apologies. Just to say I have the following apologies. Um, Jessica Andrews from Wakotahi is an apology, but I believe that Michelle um, to where I will be attending. I haven't seen her come online yet, maybe she has. Um, I've also got um, an early departure uh, at 10 a.m. for Mayor Judy Turner and Councillor Isles. Uh, an apology has been received from Chairman Doug Leader and Councillor Rose has said that he will need an 11 o'clock depart. I'm thinking this meeting could well be uh, close to over by sort of 11, 20, 11, 30. Um, have we got any further apologies, please? I don't see any, I better just put up participants. Um, um, committee secretary, can you help me with hands? Uh, on the screen I'm using, I don't see everybody at the same time, which is a bit of a pain. Yes, I'll, Mr. Chairman, we'll help with that. Just in case. Uh, thank you. Um, so moving... Um, Happy to move the apologies, Chairman. Your, thank you. That's moved by Councillor Thurston, seconded by Councillor... Um, who did that? Um, Mr. Thomas was the next one. Um, all in favour, please say aye. Against Kerry. I know I didn't record before, but I'm just pulling my things that um, Commissioner Selwood is in present as well. So I'll just take him off in my box and we will move on. Um, so public forum. Um, we do have um, an Alice Davies. Is she available on this, uh, on this, this call? Alice is here. Alice, would you mind turning your camera on for us? Uh, so Alice Davies uh, received an internship with Becca and her summer research program was uh, regarding accessibility in the public transport system. So um, it's with pleasure that we welcome Alice and um, uh, she will give a short presentation, including a PowerPoint, uh, after which we will be open for questions of clarification only. Thank you. Alice. Excuse me, Chair. Alice seems to be having some technical difficulties. Um, would you like to move on to your Chair's report and I will try and communicate with you. Okay, let's do that. We can, um, so let's just go before we do that then We'll just do, um, are there any items not on the agenda that there are none? Order of business hasn't changed. There's some um, amendments, however, of presentations that are no longer going to happen. Are there any conflicts of interest from anybody? Can't see any, so we'll move on from there. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting, are there, they are on page... Um, seven of your agenda. Would someone move that they are true and correct record for a start? Happy to move. Uh, we had Chief. that by um, uh, Councillor Isles and Mr. Thomas seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. 
Um, so any matters arising from those minutes that won't come up in the rest of the meeting. There appear to be none. So we're going to move on to the chairman's report. And just um, we're going to, um, um, Mayor Turner has to leave early and she wants to raise, uh, 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 have a couple of minutes on the um, Eastern Bay of Plenty strategic approach to PT, I believe. So uh, I'm happy to include you in this section, Mayor Turner, rather than wait in case you, you've gone. Um, but just in opening this, there's a couple of things I want to point out. It was only four or five years ago that the PT committee uh, was uh, for the Bay of Plenty was managing a budget of around $15 million. That went up to $18 million, to $23 million, to $28 million. And I'm getting really concerned uh, because it's, it looks to be over $30 million coming up for the next year. And that's without adding probably another $10 million with a staff time. So uh, please, uh, councillors and committee members, when you uh, have all these wonderful wish lists, just bear in mind there's only one person paying for it, and that's the rate payer. And uh, in these uncertain times, I think we're heading into a period of hugely constrained f um, f uh, restraints fiscally and, and with a potential to recession. And um, this PT budget, to me, is getting out of control. So that's just, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, disparaging at all at what the staff are doing. I think they're working exceptionally hard. And we have people say, oh, we've got a broken PT system. Yes, there are aspects that are broken, but in actual fact, the service delivery that we're offering is um, probably second to none. We just have to it's, uh, tweak it to make sure that it's fit for purpose where, we're, where we have it. I don't think it's the, the you know, we're putting on the buses, it's, it's getting people to utilize them. And especially in COVID times, this is very difficult. So um, I just, you know, I've had people, you know, say to me um, as a result of the media, where I said that I thought we actually, because the, the Minister of Transport uh, de uh, um, gave disparaging remarks about our public transport in the Bay of Plenty. And um, I can't um, agree with them on, on that. You know, it, it needed further clarification. Um, so um, I'm happy for Mayor Weber. You've got a question. Well, more, more a comment. You said we're putting on the buses. That's the easy part. The hard part is we're not putting in the infrastructure. And I go back to bus stops. And, and in, in this report, we're planning on putting on zero uh, in the first nine months of this year. Um, and, and I wonder how we pat ourselves on the back for such a dismal performance. Thank you. Um, just to, to understand, but bus stops is infrastructure, and we are reliant on working with our um, uh, TLA partners to, to get a better bus stop outcome. But um, your point is well noted. Um, um, you know, it's no, no point poking the finger anywhere. We've actually got to work collaboratively together to get it. Um, can I um, ask, Jay, I think all hands have gone back down. Can I ask um, James to, to open up with this report, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. And um, thanks very much for um, making the time today. We've got some very interesting items on the chairperson's report, and I'd actually like to start with one that's not even there, which is the recent government announcement about a temporary three month uh, half price uh, fare reduction, which was announced earlier this week uh, by the government. So in essence, the fare reduction will apply to any uh, public transport service that is contracted by the uh, council with one caveat, which is that we're still trying to understand whether that applies to total mobility or not. But in essence, um, where we are currently charging for fares on our 
urban network or other services, uh, those fares will be half price for a period of three months starting from 1st of April until 30th of June. And the government will be picking up uh, 100% of the bill for any fair revenue that is foregone as a result of that change. And also they will be paying uh, the uh, expenses associated with making uh, changes, particularly to the ticketing system, which is one of the main um, practical uh, elements we need to um, ensure we have right before we start the trial on the 1st of April. So to that end, staff in the operations team have been working very hard since the announcement to uh, update our uh, fares manual and provide all the information needed to in it who are the supplier uh, who run the b-card system so as of this morning we are sending all the information to in it and hopefully we are relatively uh, high up the queue because every regional council will be asking in it to do the same thing for their particular locality so we're hopeful uh, that because we've been pretty proactive and fast in getting off the mark, um, there won't be any delays and we will be able to implement the three-month half-fair trial from 1st of April. So I'll stop there and take any questions because I realise that's an item that wasn't on the report because it's happened very recently and um, we'll um, take any comments from people. Okay, I've got hands up first. Councillor Rose, Councillor... Uh, um, sorry, Mr Thomas followed by Councillor Brunning. Councillor Rose. Uh, ten, uh, ten up, okay, ten up, ten up, uh, um, yeah, look, I've got, I've got two questions um, for you, James. One, what are the new prices from the first? Um, um, just, so, just so we have a clear idea of how much it's actually going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and two, um, where, uh, will we be making... Uh, these new fears and all uh, available to the public so the public actually know that fears are cheaper for that three month period so like a communication plan or something like that yeah i'll deal with the uh, the second question first so yes communication is absolutely key to all of this so i've been discussing with our comms folks this morning about getting out some in interim comms on our website today which just explains that this is coming and that we're working through uh, the details, but um, people can expect that from 1st of April, they will be able to travel for half price where they currently pay a fare. So in terms of your first question, the details are being worked through, but essentially in the Tauranga urban area, for example, the current uh, adult B card fare is uh, $2.72. So that will be, uh, cut in half and I think rounded down to an amount that is close to whatever denominations of coins we we have left so uh, my math isn't very good but uh, $2.72 halved I think equates to about $1.35 so that half price will be applied to to all of the fares across the board and where fares are much higher, particularly on some of the rural routes that we run out, for example, in Eastern Bay, um, that half price uh, fare could make quite a significant difference to, to people. And so I think that's a particularly welcome development that the government has recognised um, because those fares, particularly for people who perhaps don't have a lot of choice, are, um, are actually quite high compared to the urban fares which actually I think are pretty good value for money already um, so that's essentially uh, what will happen we will make sure that in the comms there'll be some kind of table which says this is what the fare is at the moment this is what you can expect to pay uh, so that people hopefully are well aware of um, what um, they should be paying once we we go live there'll be uh, comprehensive comms as well with bus companies and the drivers so everyone understands that um, this is actually happening um, and so they're well aware particularly where there's ticket machines that need to be um, progressed for cash fares as well because not everyone pays on a b card um, so there'll be quite a lot of um, uh, work to do to make sure everyone is um, fully aware of what needs to be done in the next couple of weeks okay i'm going to go to uh, mr thomas 
and then uh, Councillor Browning, Councillor Thompson, and Commissioner Selwood in that order. And just remembering, after this this particular item, we'll switch uh, and give uh, Mayor Judy Turner her couple of minutes uh, because time's moving on. So, um, uh, Councillor Tom, uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, look, um, maybe just a continuation of Councillor Rose's um, question, but more of a comment around the per potential from the half price fares. Um, and of course, I'm thinking of uh, empty buses that we see rolling around Rotorua all the time. I, I would hope more than just communicating the fact we're actively promoting it perhaps on social media. I'd, I'd love to see some big stickers on the back of the buses. I was sitting in a line of traffic um, yesterday going into Rotorua behind an empty bus. Um, you know, it had its advert on the back there. And I think, you know, in that situation, we possibly could capture some people in Rotorua. Um, the high petrol prices are really impacting in our area. It's a low wage area, unfortunately, for, for us. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, just seeing a, a, an active campaign trying to push people onto buses, I think it gives us an excellent opportunity to try and increase our patronage um, the, at, at little cost to ourselves. Mm. All right, I absolutely agree. Thank you. Councillor Brunning. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. And following on from that, I, I see this as a possible golden opportunity that's come our way. And why don't uh, we, and I don't know the, the, um, the state of our finances around this, but why don't we take it further and make it a free bus fares for three months? It's not going to cost us that much money. And I need to see the figures to, to sort of really vote for this way. But let's, let's really grab it as an opportunity, publicise it, free bus fares for three months. If we're ever going to get anywhere, that would make a big difference to public attitude towards buses. Thank you. Um, we, we, we can move that further along later. That really lines up with my not spending any more money. Um, Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah, but, um, certainly support uh, Councillor Brunning's innovative idea. Um, the question I have is who is thinking about what happens after this trial and particularly how that's going to integrate with our fair review. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is far wider than simply the implementation of this government initiative and we need to be thinking quite strategically about it uh, and the opportunity it does present. Um, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Through, through the chair, just a very quick comment on that one. You're absolutely right, Councillor Thompson. This goes much wider than, than three months. And there are rumours that the government is thinking about an, an initiative that will go beyond the three months. Uh, we don't know any details yet, and there's nothing confirmed, but there is certainly a lot of pressure uh, to have a more strategic approach to uh, the cost of fares, and in particular, how they apply to, to different groups of people, and whether those fares are actually uh, fair in the, uh, in the parliament. So um, the fair review work that we're going to be doing through the RPTP, which I can talk about a little bit more later, certainly needs to be aware of what the government might be cooking up, um, because what we don't want to do is a whole load of work and then the government come along and say, actually, we're going to do this now, um, which could happen. So um, we're going to do as much as we can to find out what the thinking is in government, recognising that I want to make an announcement probably at fairly short notice, as happened this week. Thank you. Commissioner Selwood. Thank you. Just reinforcing the comments made by others. I think this is an amazing opportunity to test price sensitivity, um, and we don't have a huge awareness of that. Um, so if it were financially feasible to run uh, free fares for a while and then half for a while and then back to full, uh, the impact on understanding what that is having on patronage uh, would be a fantastic opportunity just to understand the price sensitivity and whilst it might cost us a little bit in the short term it could be invaluable knowledge uh, for the longer term just a comment thank you for that and uh, well said uh, councillor thurston 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Look, I totally agree with what Commissioner Selwood has just said and my colleague, Councillor Bruning. Look, here is a golden opportunity to roll out a trial. Um, obviously, the costings need to be done. And uh, look, we, we take on board your comments that you made at the opening of this meeting. But I think this is one golden opportunity to either celebrate or uh, put to bed once and for all uh, any arguments about uh, free fares will get untold thousands onto buses. Thanks so much. Okay, last comment, uh, Councillor Rose, and then we'll um, move this forward. Yeah, look, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Look, um, I think this is, this is a huge opportunity uh, to move forward. Uh, I know for a fact that um, the, the free fears that happened when we had the uh, rollout of RITS um, was, in, in my opinion, um, a somewhat success, and I think this opportunity um, that has been gifted to us now um, is an opportunity that we cannot miss. And of course, I understand, Chairman, your um, your desire not to spend too much money, and I share your concerns about uh, how much the public transport space is spending. However, I think this is an opportunity for um, not only our uh, well Tauranga, but also the Bay of Plenty. Um, to really make moves in the public transport space so we can move forward and know what's going to happen in the future and how we can ensure that we have a safer transition and a, and a smoother transition from uh, petrol cars and everything towards more public transport, electric vehicles and all. So um, I want to total for what um, my fellow colleague, Councillor Brunning, said um, and all the comments made prior. Okay, so... Um... What we don't know is the, the cost of this to our council, but um, what, one thing we can, uh, I'm happy to take a, a um, motion on this um, because at the end of the day, uh, it will come back to our full council to uh, agree. And at that stage, hopefully, um, we would then know what the actual cost is and how, you know, and a, a cost analysis, break-even analysis, blah, blah, blah. Um, so um, I'm going to invite Mayor Turner, knowing that she has to go in, in eight minutes to speak now. But in the meantime, um, Councillor Brunning, you, you started um, this as, do you want to work on a motion in the next, uh, well, Mayor Turner's working her magic and maybe others might like to uh, think about it as well in case we have to tweak it. So if it's all right with everyone, I'm going to just give a couple of minutes to Mayor Turner uh, for her to speak to us. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, I'm sorry I can't stay for the full meeting, but I just wanted to update you. Since our last meeting, uh, I've been part of two meetings. One was with regional council staff who put to, uh, up to us some route changes um, that they hope may increase patronage in the in the Whakatane area, and we're very grateful. We think they're good ideas, um, worth advancing, and we'll see what happens off the back of that. But because of our last meeting, and, and we, we were all in agreement that perhaps the Eastern Bay of Plenty was a little bit short in, in visibility in the um, strategic thinking, I, had a, I called a meeting with the other two Eastern Bay of Plenty mayors, and we had some of our staff present to say, look, what do we want, and what should we be putting up to the P Public Transport Committee and, and, and for the future? We weren't thinking so much in the immediate, but just what's happening now, and what could it look like in the future? We need to have a bit of a discussion. Now, and they're kind of keen on that, and, and we, I, I said to them, look, I want to know whether you want to work together in the Eastern Bay as a sub-region or to put up something, or do you want to do your own thing and put that up individually? But I, I think we need to be putting up some suggestions. Um, what came out was that within our districts, our three districts, there are a number of initiatives. We've got one where, where there's a, a service that provides um, transport, to medical appointments for some of our remote communities. We've got um, a, the Disability Resource Centre is now reviewing and looking at how they can improve public transport for their clients. And we've got a senior citizens group that's also looking at providing um, some public transport for their members, um, particularly those who can no longer drive. So there's all these little projects. Uh, Portugal has some projects as well that take people down the coast several days a week when they need to, when they need to travel. 
So what are they doing? So how do we get those people into the room and have a discussion with them to see what would be a good way forward? And I just wanted to signal to this committee that we are having some thinking. We're not looking to act outside of the mandate of the region, this regional public transport committee, but that we could perhaps together collectively put up some good suggestions to you. And we're not thinking about tomorrow, we're thinking about sort of strategically into the future what public transport could look like in the Eastern Bay of Plenty collectively. So I just wanted to let you know that we are now thinking and talking about it. I've asked for it to be a permanent uh, agenda item for the next year or two on our Eastern Bay Apprenti Joint Mayoral Committee so that we're not letting the ball drop. And, we'll, and I'll keep you informed as, as discussions proceed. Fantastic. Fantastic, Mayor Turner. Well done. I think that's a really worthwhile thing to do because um, we, we will achieve a hell of a lot more through collaboration than we will through individual uh, councils having bright ideas so well done well done to you and as it's noted um council brunning have you got some wording that you want to put to us or uh, yes thank you mr chair i didn't quite, quite get to type it no. in but I, i'm proposing something like this that staff bring forward an option of, for full bus service that's a full bus service not the uh weekend service at the moment uh, incorporating free fares to match the government announcement to halve fares from the 1st of April to the, for three months. Second. I, I think um, that, that, I mean, what we can discuss that. Um, so it's been moved and seconded uh, to, to um, the, the fact that we're on to a weekend service because of COVID is, is again a central government uh, direction. Uh, it's not something that we do lightly ourselves. Um, we are mandated by central government, depending on what the situation. So you've just put an added complication to it, um, in my view. So it's moved and seconded. Um, we will we'll take that. Amanda might like to, anybody might like to think about it. We'll do that when we, when we um, receive the, the full chair's report. So... Uh, um, Clarification, Chair. Um, I thought that was our decision that uh, we were on a standby service. Uh, yes, um, Mr Chairman, that's correct. It's a regional council decision based on the shortage of drivers. So, yes, that's not something that's been mandated by the government. It's understood by Wakatahi, but it is a decision that we've been able to take locally based on our number of drivers. OK, so I've got that wrong. That's me. OK, but, but again, <laughs> it's a different... You know, it, it, it's a, um, asking it to be done immediately on a full uh, when we don't have drivers might might complicate it. Anyway, we can discuss that when we come to it. Um, James, do you want to keep going with your report, the rest of your report? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Or if Alice is back online, then I'm also happy to give her the floor back. It's entirely up to you. Um, well, we, we could check Alice out. Alice, are you online? Yeah. I am. Okay, so Alice, um, the details that I've, I've um, told others is that you um, um, won a, an internship with Becca uh, and your summer research project was accessibility in the public transport system. It, you're more than welcome to expand on that, but welcome, Alice, and we look forward. This is not um, these public forums are not a decision-making opportunity for us. There, um, so any questions will be uh, for points of clarification only at the end of it, okay? Thank you. Alice, the floor is yours. Cool, I will just um, screen share. So let me know if that's working. It is. Cool. Do you need to go up to full screen? Slideshow. Yeah, um, there we go. Cool. Um, yeah, so my name is Alice and I am currently studying a Bachelor of Social Work at the University of Waikato um, in Tauranga. And so I got an internship through the Transportation Group, um, which is underneath Engineering New Zealand. And then I was hosted at Becca. Um, yeah, so a part of um, that was to do a research project, and I chose to do it about Tauranga bus stop accessibility. 
Um, so I want to share um, these slides just to show about um, who is the Bay of Pliny's disabled community and things like that. So um, Statistics New Zealand found in 2013 that 24% of New Zealanders were disabled um, and that was a total of 1.1 million at the time. And they found that in Bay of Pliny, it was 27% of people. Um, you should note that this is them identifying people. It's not people saying I am disabled. It might just be, I think the question was around, do you have a long-term limitation or things like that? So you can see here there's, um, 90% of adult impairments were physical. So that goes along well with mobility impairments. Um, and you can see 26% of Modi were um, identified as disabled as well. So my research purpose um, was public bus services are crucial for the disabled community as they're more likely to be of lower income and may be restricted from driving due to a disability. So Statistics New Zealand presents evidence um, that New Zealand's disabled population have higher rates of unemployment and underutilization compared to the non-disabled community. And um, the financial hardship that the disabled community are proven to face means that they are less likely to be able to afford an accessible private vehicle, such as a wheelchair-friendly vehicle, so that's why it's really important that buses and public transport are accessible. So they're not dependent on having to afford things like that. Um, so an accessible bus system would allow them to access opportunity like work, education, medical appointments, shops and social groups. So just improving their quality of life. Um, and according to the Human Rights Act, an individual living with a disability has the same rights as any New Zealander to access an avail um, a vehicle that's available to the public. So that's any kind of form of public transport. There should be um, ones that are suitable for them. So um, I had the internship for six weeks. And during that time, I did um, create a survey so this was kind of an exploratory research that focused on answering how does the current bus stop design in the Bay of Plenty affect the disabled community and how could it be more accessible? So this was yeah qualitative data that was collected through a survey um, and it was mostly asking questions about bus stops, but it was very open-ended. So even though my focus was bus stops and reviewing the design, um, it opened it for them to talk about any experience with the bus system. So yeah, there was an online survey, had about 23 respondents, it was open for about a week. Um, so these are examples of questions and results um, that I found. So the results that I found um, did kind of support my hypothesis that uh, the disabled community were negatively affected about um, the inaccessibility of bus stops and getting to bus stops. So um, I use these questions to kind of ask about uh, the range of the accessible journey to a bus stop. So things like you can see, um, do you feel comfortable using bus stop at night? That kind of allowed me to look into safety and how are safety measures used and how did they feel about the nearest bus stop? Um, so like a lot of them said that they found it um, easy to get to their bus stop. But then when I asked them about things like, um, does your nearest bus stop have a way to cross the road safely? They didn't think about that and they didn't consider that. So a lot of that was no, um, which was very interesting. Um, I also asked them to identify the nearest bus stop. So these are four examples. Um, the top two are in Tauranga, the third one here is um, at Bayfair, and then this one is at Papamoa Plaza. So they're all Bay bus routes. Um, and this is kind of like a, a good example of um, least accessible to most accessible. So this one here has no um, road markings or connectivity to a footpath or hard stand area, shelter seating, any of those things. Um, you should also note that this curb is very um, 
short. So that really affects how a person with a wheelchair can get off the bus and how a bus can lower down their ramp. So it's not at, um, at an angle that's unsafe. So yeah, the next one has connectivity to a footpath and a hard stand area, but there's still room for improvement around seating, shelter and such. Um, the next one, there's still room for shelter and you can see there's like things in the way of the footpath as such, like um, this pole, the um, rubbish bin, things like that. While in this one, the rubbish bin is out of the way. There's a clear space for the bus to be away from traffic. It has a live um, updating sign that's really helpful for um, users. I found for a range of disabilities, those signs are really helpful from people with autism to children to um, low vision or people who are deaf. Those signs are really helpful. Um, yeah, so because um, I made it so open-ended, I was able to look at research from the past that was um, explored a bit more of the bus system and then take into account what they were saying. And I especially looked at the um, Tauranga City Council's bus stop guidelines and I kind of compared to what are these people saying about their bus stops or their experience and how does that align with what is meant to be going on. Um, so these are the recommendations that I kind of came up with. So the first one is that there should be a bus stop design standard that every bus stop must meet and there should be a program of works to upgrade every bus stop. Um, I think this should be yeah, a set standard and in my opinion that the bare minimum should be connectivity to footpaths and um, good curb heights and curb stands so that concrete slab that allows people to get on and off the bus easily. Um, the next one was I recommended that disability awareness training should be there for public transport um, designers. So people like engineers or city planners um, so they can understand why these things are important. So um, with my time at Becca, I was looking and researching all these standards about um, accessible solutions and things and there's you know there's standards for how high a curb should be but you don't really think about it until you see oh this is why a curb is so important because it really affects how a person with a wheelchair can get off the bus because of that ramp and such so it's important to have that training to understand why it's all important every little part um yeah, the next one was that I thought that there should be also training for bus drivers that includes um, direct communication with the disabled community so they can really get the best um, ideas of how they can help each other. Because, um, yeah, I think there needs to be more training for the bus drivers. I know that they have a kind of a morning training, things like that, but um, I know the... Um, low vision blind New Zealand, they train, um, they do like training sessions with people who are blind to access buses by using things like cards that say um, that they hold up at a bus stop with the number of the bus that they're waiting for. And then they give it to the bus driver to say, um, give this back to me when I'm at the bus depot or things like that. So they work hard to make things like that, like cards. But then if the bus drivers aren't accommodating to helping them with those um, cards and it's not usable. Um, yeah, so I think there should be direct communication there. Um, my other recommendation was that there should be a public transport team that includes employees from um, the regional council and the city council that would promote connectivity between bus system and the bus stop facilities. So this includes bus stop maintenance, the footpaths, anything like that so that people can know who to talk to if they have a problem and they don't call up one thing, like one place, like the a regional council and say, oh, I can't get to my bus stop and I miss my bus when, you know, the regional council just focuses on the bus system. So it would be great to see them work together and create a way for people to directly contact them about a whole issue. Um, my other recommendation was to address the inaccessibility of interregional travel. 
So that's something that um, participants brought up is they cannot travel from, say, Hamilton to Tauranga because it's a privately owned bus service with, um, and lots of those buses are really big with steps to get on. If you imagine like the luggage space underneath creates big steps. So that's inaccessible for wheelchair users or even people who um, have low mobility that can't do steps. Um, so I'd like to see that um, be improved, but that would take collaboration with regional councils together. Um, my other recommendation is that um, the regional council should and the city council should review um, the standard of buses as well as the maintenance procedures. Um, I heard that things like uh, bus ramps should be uh, maintained by bus drivers and that kind of company, but that's not always maintained. So it'd be great to see that someone's checking up on that. Someone's making sure that that's getting maintained. Um, yeah, I think all these kind of re recommendations sum up a lot of what I saw, but um, going back to the guideline, I think it is a good guideline. I understand that it's a draft of sorts, but I think all the information in there is great and um, I'd like to see it implemented more. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Alice, for, um, um, for your presentation. Um, you, you do have a um, electronic report, I believe, that will be circulated to um, the, the membership of our transport committee. Is that right? Yeah, so that's been made available. And I think it will be in the notes of this meeting. So if anyone yep. wants to read it more in depth. Thank you very much for that. Now, I've got uh, questions of clarification. The first was Councillor Nees, Councillor Thompson, Commissioner Selwood in that order. And then Councillor Thurston. You're on, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My hand was actually up for, from um, the previous discussion, so maybe you could come back to me um, no, on just that. Go while you're now. Oh, well, I'll, I'll just address Alice at, yeah. um, right now, if that's all right. Alice, that's a fabulous um, presentation and going to be very, very valuable research for us um, and some wonderful recommendations. Can I ask, did you actually um, talk with representative groups for di different um, disabilities um, uh, as well as your survey? Yeah, so I did um, have communication with um, things like CCS and, like I said, the... Um, the blind, low vision, New Zealand um, people and other services that I knew of personally, um, things like that. I had a lot of open conversations with services that aren't included in the report, but were very much a part of my journey of researching to create the report. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson. Oh, Alice, I think it was absolutely brilliant. Um, well done. Um, I'm just wondering, and I'm not sure who this question should be directed at, but on mo next Monday, we have the inaugural meeting of the Tauranga City Council and Regional Council Public Transport Committee. And in answer to Councillor Webber's, sorry, um, Mayor Webber's concerns about bus shelters, etc., there is a report uh, on that agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any opportunity for Alice to be able to present uh, to that committee and you chair of the deputy chair of that committee so I'll just see that uh, with you but anyway that's a question but Alice I just wanted to say absolutely brilliant well done futures in good hands with with young people like you thank you thank you Commissioner Selwood yes I would uh, echo um, Councillor Thompson's um, commendation thank you your work is very timely Alice because um, Two key things are happening right now, and that Tower on the City Council is investing uh, significant um, sums of money uh, for the renewal and update of our public transport infrastructure, and particularly bus stops right across the whole city. Um, and so, um, as Councillor Thompson has mentioned, that is that is on the agenda of the other major initiative, which is uh, the joint. Uh, working program between both the regional council and the city council to get a better integration of services. So your report's very timely for the input into those two key 
initiatives. I'm really pleased to hear that our guidelines, albeit they are in draft, uh, sound like they're good base policy, uh, and that's great to hear. And we do have a disability advisory group to the Tauranga City Council on these particular issues. So their input is coming into the application of the guideline to the um, to the investment program. So I think um, it, it's disappointing that the standard of infrastructure is the way it is. Uh, but the good news is that it, there's a very significant investment program underway uh, to improve that. And your report is very timely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Look, um, I thank Commissioner Selwood for his reassurances there. Um, but Alice, just to be upfront, I was the National President of New Zealand CCS for some decades in Wellington, so uh, that's the perspective that I come from. But my big concern is part of CCS's core business, and they're national leaders in this, is disability awareness. And uh, it's a fundamental part of their core business. Um, and uh, they have very experienced teams, which no doubt you spoke to, uh, invariably, they're quite uh, profoundly disabled people with the appropriate skills who are leading this initiative. But my big question to you is, in talking to these groups and groups like the Foundation and IHC and others, um, they all have disability awareness consultants that work with bus drivers and entities such as ours. But do they not feel they're being listened to? Um, where is the disconnect and where are the dots not being connected here? That's what we need to know. Because the expertise is there, the life experiences are there to share with us uh, in good faith. Um, but where is the disconnect? Um, yeah, so when I was talking to companies, I think, yeah, for transport, um, most regions, I think every region except Auckland, they are very disconnected between their regional council and their city council. So when you're trying to address transport issues, it gets very lost in whose job is whose. And so, yeah, I have found that people and companies don't feel heard. They they feel like we are here, we do have all the support that we could give this information, um, but we're not being reached out to. Um, yeah, uh, my perspective is that I am technically disabled. I am better with my health, but that's my kind of view. And with my social work training, I'm trying to look at it from a whole, how does this affect um, the well-being? How does this affect um everything um even economic position or things like that so yeah I think there's a lot to be done and just um presenting the ideas in a way that people like transport planners or transport engineers things like that can um read it and know it and I think when there there are like research published like the accessible journey and things like that but if it's not a standard then it's not going to be implemented because designers and things they're not they know that they don't need to and they don't really know why it's there or um, a lot of people I talked to even in the DHB didn't know those statistics of that Bay of Plenty has 27 percent disabled population so yeah I think to answer your question that there are a lot of companies that want to help and they have the resources to help, but they don't feel like they're being reached out to. Uh, Chairman, if I can just say one more thing, um, you know, let's put it on the record. This regional council, particularly in the last triennium, has gone the extra mile for disabled and profoundly disabled people in our community. Uh, and we've rolled out various initiatives, uh, including free bus services for those and their carers. So look, we've got a lot to celebrate. You know, don't let's all fall on our sword over this. Um, but somewhere along the line, there's a disconnect around communication um, with uh, the, the resources that are out there to help train able-bodied people. And you, as you rightfully so, you know, and uh, we've gone on at length reminding our colleagues at the regional council table that one in five in Tauranga have a profound disability that impacts on their daily life. But having said that, I just would like Commissioner Selwood and Councillor Thompson and our chairman today to take this to the meeting on Monday and flush it out a little bit more and just find out, you know, the resources are there in Tauranga and they're brilliant. I know the people all individually. You will have met and talked with them. Um, but there is a disconnect somewhere. So let's just look at this positively, but in defence of the regional council, this council in its last triennium has done a tremendous amount and has to be celebrated for what it has done for disabled people. 
Thank you, Councillor Thurston. I totally um, um, agree with your sentiment. Uh, uh, Commissioner Selwood, you're on silent. Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, that leaves me to thank you once again, Alice, for that presentation. Well done. And um, we'll uh, see where, where we go with that with regard to the meeting next week. Um, can we um, uh, go back now? Um, well, I'll just go back through the program just so you have a clear understanding. In the minutes, uh, we, we're going to have a uh, presentation for, um, on the accessibility using the bus system B cards. Um, 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 uh, Carly Jones was going to present that, but uh, unfortunately can't make it today. So that is going to be deferred to the next meeting. Uh, and the uh, same with the Wednesday challenge um, uh, that will be deferred um, to a future meeting as well. So those presentations are not coming before us today. Um, can we now go back to the chairman's report, please? And I think after we've had the chairman's uh, finished off with that, we'll go have a 10-minute break for a cup of tea. Mr. Chair, I had my hand up. I oh, Sorry, I didn't see it. Apologies. I was wondering if we could take the rest of your report as read. We've all had it, plenty of time to read it and uh, just go to questions. Thank you. Uh, I, I will leave it to um, um, our presenter, James, just to pricey. Um, um, uh, the staff put a lot of work and effort into it. I know what you're saying. Uh, we want to keep it brief, but this is not going to be a long meeting. James. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I will endeavour to be brief. So in terms of the substantive report, the first item is an update on the public transport operating model. So this is the framework within which uh, regional council uh, undertakes its public transport provision services. Uh, Ministry of Transport are reviewing uh, the PTOM uh, framework in order to update it and reflect the current challenges that public transport faces. And the first of those is uh, mode shift. So there's much more emphasis now in PTOM on uh, improving services and in particular having a sustainable workforce through fair and equitable employment and that's a key one because at the moment as we'll say elsewhere in this meeting uh, we are struggling to recruit and retain uh, bus drivers to provide the services we currently have never mind any aspirations to increase the levels of service in the future so PTOM is really emphasizing the need to develop that uh, sustainable and equitable employment career for bus drivers, because without that, we're not going to be able to deliver on any of our other objectives. Um, the PTOM framework is also going to be uh, much less focused on uh, provision of commercial services and reducing reliance on subsidies. And that really reflects the reality of the situation where uh, more and more money is being allocated to the public transport system, for example, through this recent half fare announcement. And the current government are certainly placing a lot more emphasis on making public transport uh, cheaper and more accessible and of course that comes at a cost so there's certainly much more emphasis on that um, there are also implications for operational policy so there may be less onus on public transport authorities to um, competitively tender contracts but they'll still need to demonstrate value for money from um, procurement so, so those are some of the key principles around um, PTOM. I'm either happy to either answer any questions now or just briefly go through the remainder of the report and then take questions at the end, whichever you prefer, Mr Chairman. Uh, well, we can take... I've got two hands up, so let's just clear those. Councillor sure. Needs, followed by Mr Thomas. Thank you. Um, just about the PTOM review, has um, the transport said for the PT um, group of planners across the regional sector, but had an opportunity to influence 
That's yes. Um, in fact, uh, MOT have invited the Transport Special Interest Group to sit on the operational working group, which will essentially um, produce the new uh, PTOM guidance. So MOT have been very open and transparent with us and are working in collaboration. So that bodes well, because it means that the people who are the experts will be able to influence the new PTOM and get it working for us. And, and do you think that it will um, provide us with a lot more flexibility um, to if the size of buses and the um, more opportunity to review contracts, et cetera, because it, it was mandated as a nine-year contract, which is yeah. a very long time given um, you know, how quickly things are changing? Yeah, I think there's like to be a lot more flexibility on a whole range of issues because I think the problem with the current PTOM is it, it's a kind of a bit of a one size fits all and every region and every service is is very different so what work might work well for one region might not for another so i think flexibility is likely to be much more apparent oh that's excellent um and mr chair if you if you don't mind i'd just like to make a comment on the uh, proposal for um staff to come back on a free fair initiative i just there's a couple of things i'd quite like to point out one is we've got a very short time frame, and I think our next council meeting is the 31st of March. Um, and there could be substantial, while I support it um, as, a, as a proposal, um, I think what we need is a range of options. Because can, we, can we hold that discussion till the motion, we know, till the motion's actually put, and then we'll, let's do that as a discussion rather than piecemeal it now? No, well, I, I think it, it might it might influence the, the recommendations put through, Mr. Chair. Because as if you let me finish, um, I was going to suggest um, that we ask staff to come forward with options um, as opposed to just one proposal. Because um, just looking at our budgets uh, at our Arataki report later in the agenda, it could be up up to uh, five hundred thousand for three months. And we've got a very short time frame to put it in place. So I would rather um, staff have the ability to put forward what they think is feasible what, rather than what we think is feasible. You'll get that opportunity when we discuss the motion, but thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, just a, a quick question. You were mentioning the difficulty of, of um, getting and retaining staff for our bus services. I just wondered, you know, we, we um, saw the extension of the living wage um, to, to the last few um, companies holding out on that, I guess. Have we had any feedback or any evidence on what the living wage, has, what difference that may have made to recruitment of, of new drivers? Uh, through the chair, I can certainly provide a view based on discussions I've had with the trade unions and also the bus company. So whilst the living wage of $22.75 is certainly an improvement on uh, the previous situation, uh, the reality of the market is that uh, drivers can earn uh, substantially more money uh, in other careers such as driving trucks or even uh, stacking shelves at uh, uh, DIY stores. So the, the reality is that 2275 in the market is not really cutting it at the moment. And that's why drivers are voting with their feet. And um, myself, the unions and the bus company, I think are all agreed on one thing is that this situation uh, can't continue and um, we have to look at ways of making the bus driving career uh, more attractive and sustainable across a whole range of factors pay being actually only one of them so at the moment for example greater wellington essentially is now paying 27 dollars an hour to reflect the realities of cost of living in that part of of the world um, the government is shortly going to be uh, embarking on uh, a further review of wages um, for what's called fair pay as opposed to living wage. Um, if I was a betting man, I would say that's going to uh, recommend a wage somewhere north of $27 an hour. 
So uh, the reality is that um, if we're looking at investments in the future public transport system, um, drivers are going to be very, very high on that list because without drivers, we don't have a system. Thank you. Uh, Mia thank you. Could, um, could I just uh, a quick supplementary on that, um, Chair? Sure. Yep. Um, you know, look, uh, thanks for that um, report back. And I kind of agree with you, James, around the wages. Um, I actually was a bus driver many, many years ago now. Um, I would say it's a really tough job and not just around wages, but around the hours worked. Yeah. And perhaps we should also be looking at um, a, a less onerous, um, you know, roster. I worked split shifts um, for a while. In the end, you paid for eight hours and you worked for 11. <laughs> yeah. I think, there are, you know, I think we could get a bit more creative too, um, yeah. not just looking at wages. And I'm glad you mentioned looking at other services. I think that's vital. Split shifts was top of my list. Great. Thank yeah. you. We Thank you. Mr. Thomas, we are in governance, so that's getting down into the operational. Mayor Weber, followed by Councillor Brunning. Yes, yeah, so I'm just um, sitting here amused that uh, we're using ad hocery for our policy development. I just think before we charge off, uh, and I'm talking more to 2.2, the, the regional council response to driver shortages. In 2003, when I left the dairy industry, $55 an hour was a reasonable rate to keep people. Uh, fast forward 19 years, and, uh, and we're talking about the living wage. I think the other thing you need to look at if you're doing the analysis is what are the competing op options around us? And right now, you're in the middle of the kiwifruit industry, and they're not interested in paying the live living wage for drivers. So you'll have, a, you'll have a problem getting drivers in our part of the world because you've got a competing interest right there. I, I also talk about, you know, your free fares option uh, because you've got a window of opportunity. Just be careful how you frame up whatever you're looking to do there because you're in the same time frame. The next three months, you're right in the heart of the kiwifruit industry where drivers are more attracted to work in that industry than they are in ours. So I'm just saying... Be, beware that you actually know what you're doing here and frame up what you're looking to do really well and mindful of the extenuating circumstances around us that make life difficult to get drivers at the living wage. I think you're dreaming if you think that's how, how you're going to attract drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Weber. I think that's um, taken on board. Mayor uh, Councillor Brunning. Uh, given that uh, what has just been uh, talked about, I, I am a little confused. I thought we had gone on to um, a weekend service because of COVID. Um, so I want to understand, are we likely to come out of that COVID situation and back to a full service? Um, or is the reality that we do not have drivers to go back to a full service. I think those are two different scenarios. We need to be honest with ourselves. Yeah, through the chair, I can certainly address that point. So in the Tauranga situation, there have been challenges with driver retention and recruitment, which means that although we had theoretically enough drivers to run the service, there was no resilience in terms of standby drivers or um, people to cover absences such as COVID or holidays or anything like that. So the, the issue is certainly wider than COVID in the Western Bay in particular. Um, so when we took the decision to reduce the uh, weekday service to weekend, uh, although COVID was a small factor in that, there were wider issues about just the number of drivers for the reasons that um, that I've explained. In Rotorua, it's been slightly different. We did actually have more uh, standby drivers available, but COVID has hit uh, Richie's quite hard and quite quickly. So we've had to take a very uh, snap decision, essentially, to reduce that that timetable out of necessity from uh, the uh, Monday to Saturday to Sunday, which is certainly not something we we wanted to do 
at all. So there's a look, there's a range of factors, and COVID is just one of them. So supplementary, uh, Mr. Chair, does that mean that we are in a crisis situation? Um, any other industry would, I think, call it a crisis if we cannot deliver what we have promised to deliver to the to the public. Um, and how are we going to address this? Are we going to just be having a reduced service um, for, you know, a long period of time, which, you know, we have to address this? Yeah, through the chair, my feeling at the moment is that once Omicron has receded, we're certainly intending to go back to the full service, but we can't ignore the wider issues about driver recruitment and retention. So in my view, it is going to require some work between ourselves as regional council, uh, the government, uh, who have a big role to play in this, uh, the unions and the bus company working together on a common plan across New Zealand, because this is a New Zealand problem, not a Bay of Plenty problem, to actually once and for all um, outline a package of um, employment conditions and pay for drivers that are actually you know, realistic in terms of being able to, uh, as others have rightly said, compete with other industries who are just able to offer those wages. So um, I do agree it is a serious situation and I talk regularly with colleagues in other regions where the situation, believe it or not, is even worse. Uh, so you go to somewhere like Otago um, where they are really, really struggling in parts of the country. So this needs to be a national initiative between all of us to uh, address. And to be fair to the government, they are looking to do that through this fair pay uh, agreement work. Thank you. I've got uh, Councillor Thompson followed by Mayor Weber. Um, yeah, I know we're going to come and discuss the motion, but I, I just wanted to say that as the seconder of the motion currently on the floor, um, the reason I, I seconded it was because I saw it as an opportunity. But I saw it that what staff would do in their report would certainly be to look at the pros and to certainly look at the cons, of which we've had some discussion this morning, and arrive at a sensible way forward. So it wasn't just a rush of blood to the head. It was, in fact, an expectation that the pros of such an approach and the cons would be very carefully analysed by our staff, and we would be presented uh, with a, a reasonable way forward through this quagmire. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, Mayor Weber. Yeah, thanks. There's two issues here. There's the short-term issue that was raised earlier, but the, the, the bigger issue is, and I, I suspect if you're looking, you need to get somebody from the Road Transport Forum to come and speak to. I, I, it's, it's a regional council view. We, we try and drive the, the prices down in our contracts, but we don't recognise in the transport industry, driving a bus would be recognised as one of the most difficult roles of any driving. You start driving a car, that's relatively easy. When, it, when you get up to a heavy truck, that becomes real difficult. But when you're in the passenger space and, and working around stops and starts and, and all that sort of thing, and the other social issues the drivers face, you add another layer of complexity. And so you've, you've got to look at the, the, what you're trying to attract by way of income has to meet all those demands. And I think that's the big disconnect where the regional councils and the public transport throughout New Zealand are trying to drive down their costs. And I can understand that, but they're not recognising the complexity of the service you're trying to provide. So you've got to be prepared to pay that price and accept that public transport has a far different dynamic financially into it. You'll never make a profit out of it. So you're providing a service and you're trying to remove congestion. So you have to take a far different holistic approach to how you fund this whole thing. And $40 million, it may be $100 million is the solution. But you, you've got to look at it holistically. So I think I hear where Councillor Thompson's coming from on, on, on the motion that's on the table, but I think it's actually wider than that. The motion on the table is just a, a, a short term because we've got some government funding. 
But the issue is far bigger than that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see um, Councillor Brunning has his hand up again. Are you wanting to talk about the motion or uh, is it the wider part of the report? I just want to uh, remind uh, Mayor Weber that uh, this is a contract. We don't supply it. This is a contract. Thank you. Okay. Uh, James, is that the end of your report? Yes, it is, Mr Chair. Yeah, okay. I think all the other stuff in there we've already discussed uh, in passing already, so I don't think we need to repeat it again, so I'm happy to go to um, the motion. Okay, so okay. in the agenda, we receive the report, uh, and I'm happy to move that we receive it, um, and I need a seconder for that, and that's Mr Thomas, and uh, all those in favour, please say aye, against carried, and then we have a second resolution, um, um, uh, Amanda, are you able to, um, have you got that? How, how's it looking? Can you see that? Yep. 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 Mr. Chair, I'm happy with that um, there. It does provide options. Um, and the op one option may be status quo. Um, but uh, I would suggest on the timing issue that you might like to consider at the end of this meeting today that you adjourn the meeting and we come back together in another week's time uh, to debate this. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson, you were you are seconding this motion. Is that, are you happy to second it as per the wording? The difficulty I have is, is with the word provide. Um, I thought our motion, the original motion was investigate. And I come back to what is, you know, I think a very good discussion this morning around the strategic issues, you know, both the opportunities and the threats uh, that will arise out of such a motion like this. So I don't want to be pedantic, um, but, you know, staff, I really think that our, the gist of what we've been talking about this morning is just perhaps far wider, as Mayor Weber has said. So I'd really like a full analysis in terms of pros and cons and potential way forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I go back to the mover, Mr. Br uh, Councillor Brunning? Are you happy with a change of wording to investigate? Yep, completely. Rather than provide? So yep. um, the, it is on the table. Um, speaking for or against, Mayor Weber. On silent at the moment. Sorry, I'd like to move an amendment, which is pretty much where Councillor Thompson was at. Given the extenuating circumstances, and I talked about the Kiwi fruit industry and the government announcement, they're, they're in parallel. So, so you've got some competing tensions. I think that the what we're trying to do is direct staff to investigate options for a full bus service incorporating free fares to find if that will improve patronage. Full stop. This, this is a far bigger issue than just taking a window of opportunity um, because, you, as I said, the competing tensions you've got is bus drivers are hard to find right at the moment because they're all driving kiwi fruit trucks. Thank you. Um, do I, I don't, I see that as a, um, it's not a, a direct opposite or anything, so I can accept the amendment as a seconder for it. I'm happy to second that, Ms. Uh, Commissioner so Selwood. So, seconded by um, Commissioner Selwood, moved by Mayor Weber. Can we have the wording? Um, just leave the, if you could, Amanda, please leave the wording that's already up there and just put it as a um, go, just try again, just to save you, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll test it as to, as to an amendment. So, you don't right. lose what, what was the wording of the amendment? Well, it's after the word fares to improve patronage. Now, that's what, that's what you're doing it for. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that... Do you want to leave in the rest of the words after that, Mayor Weber? No, I, I think they're redundant. The problem with what, when, you, when you talk about the government announcement, 
that's constraining it to a, to the next three months, and you're competing with with uh, the kiwi fruit people and the other. So you you may not get drivers. So you'll get you'll get a perverse outcome. This is bigger than I think just the next three months. This is a strategic view. That, that you know we want to do this for the right reasons. Okay, so we've got this as an amendment on the table now. So it reads, direct staff to investigate options for a full bus service incorporating free fares to improve patronage. Moved by Mayor Weber. The, this amendment is moved by Mayor Weber, seconded by um, Commissioner Thurston. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Uh, Commissioner Selwood, Commissioner Mr Thurston, Chairman. Commissioner Thurston, I'm um, sorry, Commissioner Selwood, followed by... I can only by, dream, Chairman. Eh? I can only dream. Yeah, Councillor <laughs> Knees. Commissioner uh, Thurston. Um, yeah, I'll be voting. So, Commissioner Selwood first, and then uh, Councillor Knees. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm actually happy with the additional wording. I, I don't think it detracts from... I agree with Mayor Weber's uh, observations that this is a, a strategic issue, but I do think this is a prime opportunity given the government's um, half transport, but I'm happy either way, to be fair. Councillor Nees? I prefer the original wording, Mr Chair, and I won't be supporting this. Um, we have, uh, the Regional Council has had discussions about free fares, um, but I think would be willing to uh, to look at it again if it was for a, um, a, a, a pilot or a, a shorter period. The full cost is, is major for the Regional Council, so um, I would rather have it time limited. Um, and linked to the opportunity that's ahead of us. So I'll be voting against um, Mayor Weber's uh, proposed amendment. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I, I don't see any problem with keeping um, the wording as it's appearing on our screen now. Um, I think that provides some context uh, for this matter. I'm getting increasingly concerned about the disconnect between this committee and the regional council um, decision uh, making, dare I call it, authority, and we need to address this because this PT committee is putting a lot of work and effort uh, into trying to address bums on seats, et cetera, but ultimately the decision maker uh, is the regional council who holds the purse strings. So I think there's a disconnect here and I think it's of concern and we need to address it. Um, quite how that happens. I've got some ideas, but I'll save those for later. But I do believe that the leaving in of those latter words just provides the kind of context uh, for why we're looking at this initiative now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Weber, are you looking for a right of reply or, or are, you, are you happy to leave those um, that as it stands now as the wording, or do you want to go back to your um, proposal to, to remove the second half of it? Uh, a procedural but, comment. If the original mover and seconder are comfortable with that wording, that complete wording that's up there now, then I, we could withdraw the amendment. Um, right, yes. Mr Chairman, and then you can vote on this that's in front of you now. Yeah, so so if this gets defeated, we go back to the original amendment. You're suggesting that we seek leave from the original mover and seconder to make this the primary motion. Absolutely, because the, you know the wording is not significantly different. Okay, so okay. we'll go to uh, Councillor Brunning uh, because we can't do it without Councillor Brunning and Councillor Thompson. Uh, that, Agreed. That that seems uh, okay. Uh, it is only for three months. We're not looking at, at free fares forever. Uh, certainly not at this stage. I don't think it's un affordable, but this is just an opportunity uh, with the government announcement uh, to see if we can match it. It's looking at options. Uh, as I said before, one of the options may be the status quo, but um, I think we just have to look at it and we need the funding side of it to understand have we been saving funding while we've gone to the weekend service? Uh, are there any uh, credits uh, in the account at the moment? 
um, are there not? And we have to put that all in the mix to decide whether we go uh, fully for this or not. So I, I will support the uh, motion as worded on the screen. Thank you. And the second, up, um, Councillor Thompson? Support. Support. So we've got a, a motion that is um, now the, the substantive motion. Um, and um, Mayor Weber, are you wanting to, uh, have you got your hand up again? Uh, sorry, I haven't, I haven't taken it down. That's okay. No problem. Are, are there anybody wanting to speak to this motion as it stands now before we put the motion? Yeah. Okay. We, we, oh, Chairman. <laughs> um, Chair, if, if I could speak to please. Phil Thomas. And myself. Well, well, I've got Commissioner Selwood first. Thank you. Um, look, I'm going to support the motion, obviously, but um, one of the particular points in the investigation is to ensure that we have a method of monitoring patronage before, during and after the various fare levels. And I make that observation, I was going to raise it under the Chair's report, but we've recently had an upgrade of our service uh, through Papamoa, uh, and it would be fantastic to understand the before and after outcomes of whether the change in service has delivered increased patronage. Um, and I think that's that's been lacking to date in our work, is the clear analysis. So um, we don't have to change the motion, but I think the staff need to take on board the, the assuming this presu, uh, proceeds, we need detailed analysis of the before and after impact. Thank you. Okay. So I can't see the second line of hands, I don't think. Um, or can I? Council I can Wonder see Councillor Thurston. I've got Councillor Thurston and then Mr Thomas is what I understand. Yeah, Chairman, a lot of what we're trying to pursue here is about uh, implementing a trial to see if it's going to be successful or not. And I do believe uh, in the last line where it says half price public transport fares, we should add the words uh, as a trial for a period of three months. Uh, I think it's pretty important that we emphasise that we are supporting staff investigating a trial. Um, and I'm just thinking of people reading this long after we have all gone. So um, uh, that's just a suggestion. I don't want to be redesigning it camel here, but I do think those words are critical to the resolution if the mover and seconder would accept it, that half price public transport fares for a trial for a period of three months. Do we have, um, I, I, I'll accept that um, and make it that whether the primary uh, movers will accept that so we don't have to go to an amendment. Uh, Brunning, Thompson, yep. Thompson, Stone, willingness size, Brunning, we'll make that the substantive motion now. And who have we got, please? Um, is it Mr. Thomas, I think? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and and um, I also support that add of adding as a trial in there. Uh, we are talking about taking advantage of an opportunity where the cost to us is lower than it would be otherwise. Um, I do wonder if we need to, well, I think the, the important thing is that there is some urgency to staff doing this and bringing it back to us. Um, I, I hear what um, Councillor Nees was saying about it needing to go to regional council, which I understand meets on the 31st of March. So if we're going to be making a recommendation to um, the full regional council. We need to do that before the 31st of March. Um, there was a comment about perhaps us um, having an extraordinary meeting in a week's time. Um, I would fully support that. I think we do need to act on this quickly um, to take advantage of that half price period starting from 1st of April. Thank you. Noted. Um, that that will um, the 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 ways um, staff might like to give us a lead as to whether um, if we put this through, whether it then becomes a regional council decision at the end of the day, or does it need to come back to this committee at, at having a special meeting it's just through, through this 
Through you, Mr Chairman, it doesn't have to come back to this committee, but it does have to go to the Regional Council. And with the time available, you might want to make the recommendation to the Regional Council. Um, I don't believe there will be enough staff um, time available for a meeting next week to investigate those options fully and to report back to this meeting. The report, yeah. the papers for that meeting would have to go out this week or early next week, and uh, we simply don't have time to do it. So if you make it to the Regional Council on the 31st, we could do a verbal report um, to the Council meeting, it's only two weeks away, um, where this matter could be discussed, where the funding would need to be approved anyway. Exactly, because we can only recommend to our full Regional Council anyway. We're, we're, um, so... Directing. And it would be that staff recommends the regional council that staff. So, and it would be a, a report then would go to um, the regional council. Okay, we're at uh, Mover and uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it comes back to what I said earlier, which is I believe the disconnect between a committee like this, uh, which is a regional committee, which is making a recommendation up to the regional council, and it relates to what rights would the regional council have uh, to decline the recommendation, uh, and are there any processes involved in and around that? So I think governance needs to give some thought uh, to this because um, I think, Mr. Chairman, the on-demand trial uh, isn't exactly the same boat in terms of the role of this committee making recommendations, but the role of the regional council in being able to overturn those recommendations or not accept them. So I think there are some interesting process issues. Thank you. Yes, there are, but because of the urgency, uh, this committee can only recommend to regional council anyway if there's um, because of the funding implications so i think um yes we we might need to look at that um further uh, going forward but right now that if we're going to get this looked at uh in a in, in time for the to match with the central government uh free uh half price service um then we need to be really um um, um you know uh, prioritize this right now so I'm happy with this wording as it stands and that recognizing that it will go to the regional council that will have to make the final decision on this. Uh, Councillor Nees, have you got a oh, further thank question? You. I support the recommendation as it is Mr Chair. The issue that Councillor Thompson uh, raises is, is really to do with the terms of reference of the Public Transport Committee which doesn't give it financial delegation. Um, yep. So that needs to be looked at at some point. Um, and potentially the new triennium is the time to review that. Um, but I'll be supporting this particular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I don't see any further hands up unless I've missed somebody. I'm Mr. Going. Chairman, could I just make the point that this is a very tight time, time frame for staff to be able to report back to the 31st of March, and we will do our best to provide the information that we do have um, for that meeting on the 31st, but and that's um, a full investigation, have. yeah, and a full investigation that weighs up all the options, pros and cons, will not be possible in that time frame, but we'll no. do the best we can for the 31st. I appreciate that, absolutely, and, and it might be that, that we can't get a, a, a decision by the 31st of March to, to line up with the government, but um, that, yeah, we'll, we'll do our best as it is. Yes, so I'm, I'm going to put, we've already put uh, number one, the receive the report. Um, Councillor Brunning moved, Councillor Thompson second. Uh, number two, we're voting on right now. Can I have all those in favour, please raise a hand. Against carried and just for clarification Commissioner Selwood you raised the thing hand was that against or for that was a for thank you okay thank you okay so that is the end of that committee before we go 
on to the um, um, Arataki report on page 20. Can I suggest that we take 10 minutes? It's 11 o'clock now, oh, 10.59. We come back at 10 past. Uh, we take a 10-minute break for a coffee. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. just before you leave, can I just ask, um, is there going to be a presentation today on the on-demand trial? Um, it's not on the agenda. Through the chair, perhaps I can talk to that one. So um, this came out through the annual plan discussions in terms of bringing an on-demand trial back to the Public Transport Committee to work through. Um, we weren't able to get um, this onto the agenda in time, so we will be looking to have a separate public transport workshop in the near future on that. Take your coffee, everybody. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to have to leave. So, um, yeah, yes. just accept my apologies there. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you. We're back into open session. Um, and I would ask that for this report, James and Simon Bell, I believe, are um, presenting this report. So without further ado, James, Simon, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this really is the Simon Bell show. So for uh, those of you who don't know Simon, he is the newly appointed uh, team leader for our transport data systems team and uh, he's got some really interesting insights into some of the latest figures that we've got through from the Arataki report so I shall hand over to Simon to take you through that. Excuse me okay. Chair, can we just wait for a couple more members to turn their videos on so we have a quorum please? Well I, I suppose we can. Well done, Amanda. Sorry, I was here. I'd just forgotten. <laughs> How many more do we need, Amanda? All good now. Okay. Simon, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Councillors um, and James for that introduction. Yeah, look, I don't know how exciting it's going to be, but um, you've had the report for a couple of weeks now, so what I'll do is keep it very high level. Um, and basically, it's the public transport Arataki Tuarua um, patronage insights. So I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this works. Okay, can you can you all see that now? Yes, um, yes we can. Main slide. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before I start, I might actually bring your attention to a slight error in the uh, actual report attached to the agenda. So the Arataki itself is fine, but uh, the patronage table on page 21 of the agenda, um, the total column is incorrect. We seem to be having a few problems with that particular table, but uh, it's under the spotlight to resolve for next time. As I say, the Arataki report itself is correct. Okay, so moving on, um, keeping it very high level, uh, basically pages 27 to 34 of your agenda cover off detailed patronage for each area um, under the council's uh, jurisdiction. But just focusing at a very high level for the region, we've had uh, 578,000 boardings for the quarter, um, October through December, which uh, is down 5.3% on prior year. Um, I think there are a couple of drivers for that. We had a new COVID system come into effect during that period. And I think there's been a bit of uh, behavioral change. So perhaps people are working from home more, but also um, they're a bit discombobulated about how it's all working um, and working through how they're going to keep uh, connecting to their jobs and so on. So I think that's been part of the, the reason for that fall. Um, we did have a couple of other things impacting patronage. 
as you say, uh, we don't have a before and after view of these things just yet, but we're working on it and we'll present that later when we have a larger data set. First one was uh, the bus network refresh, uh, connecting Tauranga with the Mount Papamoa and Te Puki, uh, which was implemented on the 15th of November last year. Um, we had some great feedback on that, uh, especially on Route 2, um, connecting Papamoa to, to the CBD. Um, some really good feedback. It's, it's still bedding in. Um, we've had some school holidays during that period, so we don't have a really representative data set, but things are looking good. Um, the other thing that happened on the same day was the hub in Whakatane, which again has been quite well received anecdotally. Um, and then finally, I'll just draw your attention to the chart at the bottom of the slide um, where we're showing ourselves against uh, Bay of Plant, sorry, Waikato and Otago. We don't have a full data set for Otago, not, not sure what's uh, delayed their December data, but I imagine they track quite closely to us. But we have had an interesting dip in October for Waikato, and then they've picked right back up in December. So whether that's an aberration in the data of some sort, we are working on, but I suggest it's been reported to Waka Katahi, so it is what it is. Um, our trends look more seasonal, and they, they do reflect prior years. So I suggest our data is correct and that Waikato, um, I'll continue questioning on, on that uplift through December. So while it's not directly pertinent to last quarter of, uh, sorry, quarter two, uh, I did th thought I'd call out uh, the school fair free trials in Whakatane and Rotorua. Um, basically peak times, they have been given free fares and they pay outside of the normal fare outside of uh, those peak times. But we did see a slight increase, especially in the first two days of operation for, um, for both areas. Whakatane Ohopi uh, Route 122, I think it is, tailed off over time, um, but Rotorua has continued, uh, shown some good growth. So I think these two charts actually represent uh, peak times only, so it's, it's a true story. Um, Rotorua is up 37% on last year, which is really quite telling. Uh, Whakatane, again, is up only 1%. And personally, I have a view that that may be because the 122 was already heavily utilized by school kids anyway, as their only route over the hill. Um, but we can tease that out over time when we've got more information. The other thing I'll call out is this is based on only 14 days of data. so. Um, It'll be good to see how that tracks in the next Arataki. Uh, we don't really have a, a solid data set to show what the full-time free fares in Tauranga impact have been having, but um, that, that's for next Arataki. We'll tease that out. Okay, um, we've made some additions to the Arataki report. It's blown out by quite a few pages, I'm sure you've noticed, but we're hoping that it's delivering a bit more pithy information um, so specifically on page 36, we've added some additional route level information on tertiary trials. And we've tried to split out by the routes, the budget subsidy and local share for each, each of them, just to give a bit more clarity as, as one carrying the load for the others when you look at it at a more aggregate level. So that granularity um, gives a lot more detail. Page 37, we've got a breakdown of complaints by route um, specific to, I believe, complaints relating to uh, timeliness and mistrust. And then 46, page 46 of the agenda, we've got a new appendix three, which shows um, patronage by route and month. So I think that's been uh, asked for previously and we've finally been able to deliver that. Um, it's pretty much all based off RITS information. So there may be a couple of routes missing where we collect manual data, but um, yeah, it's, it should add another element to your view of the world. Um, another thing not shown on this particular slide is punctuality by route for Tauranga and Rotorua, which again is quite telling. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a, in a moment. Um, customer experience, the customer contact center took three, 3,500 calls approximately uh, over the quarter. 
um, which represented 37% of total calls received. Um, that's relating to transport calls, uh, which is a huge volume. And then after hours, uh, TCC received another 1.5K of calls, which is 72% of total after hour volume relating to transport, um, which makes sense. It's probably people standing on the side of the road wondering where a bus is. Um, so complaints per 10,000 boardings have trended down for Tauranga, um, possibly as a result of the improvements to the Eastern unit. Uh, but Rotorua has been trending up um, to an average of 6.6 .6 complaints per 10,000 boardings across the months of that quarter. Um, and in December, it spiked to 9.42 complaints per 10,000 boardings, which as a total isn't a lot, but that trend is something we'll keep an eye on. Uh, we think that's probably, well, I think that that's largely due to the delays caused by ongoing roadworks on State Highway 30, 36 and 5 at Nongataha. Um, we'll continue to work with Wakapatahi uh, Rotorua Lakes Council to keep the travelling public up to date um, and work with our bus operator to minimise those delays. Total mobility and accessibility, which is a, uh, a touch point of today's meeting, uh, on page 42 of your agenda, we've got a bit more detail, quite a lot of narration, but uh, just speaking to the headlines, uh, we had 15,665 passenger trips taken on total mobility during the quarter, which is a 14% 14 uh, 14 increase on quarter one, which is really encouraging. Uh, we have a total of 3,746 registered TM scheme members as at the end of that quarter. Uh, and we processed 167 new applications during the period. Excel accessibility concession, which has been going for about six months now. Um, during the quarter, we had 18,572 accessibility concession trips taken, which is amazing. Um, most of those, of course, are in Tauranga, and we've got a, a breakdown there of the spread. Um, and then we processed and accepted another 199 applications during the quarter. And finally, um, that leads to an aggregate total since the inception of 1,218. So there's been really good uptake on that. Um, and it's a, a valuable uh, service we're offering. Um, we have added an extra chart on page 19. That might be page 19 of the Arataki report. Apologies for that. Um, to show the total mobility patronage by area which uh, was obfuscated a little bit previously. And finally, financial performance. Um, operating revenue at the end of quarter two was 0.7 million lower than budget. Uh, full year forecast is that we're going to be 3 million lower than budget due to, uh, and I will call out that this is uh, prior to the government's announcement this week. Uh, due, by and large to lost fare revenue due to COVID, estimated at 0.4 million. Uh, Waka Katahi have confirmed that they'll uh, continue to provide assistance to cushion the impacts, but only up until 30th of June 2022 at this stage. Uh, Waka Katahi declined funding for the Rotorua optimization, um, a balanced approach, resulting in lower than planned fare revenue of 0.6 million. And finally, the Western Bay of Plenty Transport Systems Plan has been deferred. Uh, so that's another lower than planned subsidy of two million. Uh, operating expenditure at the end of Q2 was 0.9 million lower than budget. Full year forecast is 0.37 million lower than budget, primarily due to uh, the Western Bay of Plenty Transport Systems Plan, which has a full year budget of uh, two million has been deferred and Rotorua, again, Rotorua's optimization, a balanced approach uh, has been declined. So that was uh, 1.6 million of operating expenditure. And finally, cost savings as a result of the Tauranga network refresh are included in the forecast and help to offset rising indexation costs uh, linked to inflation, which we are seeing very much spiking. Um, and I imagine quarter three and going forward will continue to grow. So that's going to impact on fuel costs and contract costs in general. So uh, it's just something for us to keep an eye on and it will impact funding. Thank you. 
Okay, so I've got um, hands raised by uh, Mayor Weber, followed by um, Commissioner Selwood, followed by Councillor Thompson, in that order. Mayor Weber. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one's around the total mobility slide, where you've got a total of about 15,000 uh, movements over the, over the period with 3,746 registered do we know, and, and I go back to the young lady's presentation earlier on, those 3,746, is that them using the facility four times over the quarter? You know, to get a bit more data from those people to say, is that what they're doing? Because we might be, we may, we might be better to target the, the use, as, as um, Mayor Judy was saying earlier on. And just to work out what's the impediment to those people not going there? Because I know we're getting a lot of pressure with our cycleways that they're not very much, they're not user friendly for people in mobilities um, scooters because we haven't got ramps up up to them. Um, so I just wonder if there's a bit more work needs to be going on the back there. My second question or comment is around the the capital works. Um, I would have expected, and we, I've raised this many times before, both here and at the the regional transport committee we need a solid report on all of those capital projects where are we at in are they in time are they in scope and are they on budget you know to, to get eight months into our into our financial year and see no bus bus stops being presented no no curbing changes to to make the the mobility a lot more uh, accessible I, I'm just a little bewildered as to, you know, how we can go so far in the year and do nothing. So is there a report I'm not seeing some data? Thank you. Good questions. Do, do you, um, staff want to comment on those? My first comment, um, adding on to Mayor Weber with regard to total mobility, um, we're, we're seeing a, a, a good uptake there are we seeing a, a good uptake, uh, conversely, of, of people who would otherwise take total mobility moving on to using the buses? Because that, if we can achieve that, um, then, then we'll be, we can show we've got an improved bus service and, and, taking, and we'll get some savings out of total mobility. So I just wonder if staff wanted to comment on that. Yeah, through so the chair, I can make a couple of general comments and then hand over to Simon to answer any uh, data related questions. So in response to the infrastructure points, the City Council are putting together a program of uh, bus stop improvements in Tauranga. And my understanding is that that is going to be reported to the new uh, Joint Public Transport Committee on Monday. So hopefully they will be able to provide some confidence that um, uh, infrastructure improvements are starting to work through uh, the system. They receive money through the NLTP under low cost, low risk. And in my view, they're doing a good job in getting that program uh, together. They've done a lot of work, particularly to understand the current uh, locations and asset conditions and have prioritised a programme for discussion at that committee meeting. So things are definitely happening. Um, in terms of total mobility, I think it is just important to remember that that service is designed for people with um, profound disabilities who are basically not able uh, to use the conventional um, public transport system. So there are clear criteria as to who is eligible for total mobility uh, versus those who who are not. So in terms of any transfer, it's it's generally unlikely because people who use total mobility, their impediments are usually um, for life. And so we have uh, uh, the same uh, cohort of customers pretty much um, throughout uh, the, uh, the situation. So basically, that's just a comment on uh, that um, that point. We certainly though should, as the, the presentation from Alice earlier 
uh, make it much easier for people who have mobility impairments but could use the conventional service if only we had um, better access um, to bus stops and indeed better access onto the bus. Just well, a supplementary of that, Mayor Junie Turner and several others have raised this over the last three years that I've been on this committee. If we know what it is, it may be better to put on a, a, a speci specifically designed vehicle for shifting these people from their point to where their point is. If we know a bit more, um, it's, it's, it's a bit more data behind it to make sure we're providing the right facility for the right um, customer base. Thank you. Commissioner Selwood. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just quickly in response to the um, to the bus stop infrastructure and the capital program, um, it's fair to say that we, and James's report was very accurate, we're, we're at the early stages of this, sadly, uh, but that is the reality. Um, the biggest issue we're going to be facing, I'm told, is getting agreement from landowners to have a bus stop in front of their premises of their house. And of course, the more sophisticated the bus stop is to meet the disability standards, the more difficult it is to get um, permission from landowners to, or, or consent um, and support from landowners. So sadly, it's going to be a fairly tortuous process that we have to work through, um, but it is beginning. Um, just on the, um, I'd like to say thank you to Simon for the data and reporting that is starting to come through. I think um, we're starting to see a, a quite significant improvement in that. Um, my background before I was a um, commissioner and before Infrastructure New Zealand was a service delivery provider at the Automobile Association running the breakdown service in the northern region uh, for the AA. Um, and I mean, frankly, we could not have run an efficient breakdown service if we didn't know demand by time of day uh, how many drivers and uh, vehicles we've got on the road and the cost of those by time of day, whether it was better to have a service contracting model with towing companies versus staffing ourselves and managing that supply and demand down uh, to quite a finite level to manage costs and increase services to members. And there's always a trade-off between those two, two issues. And I think that's the sort of service model um, that we need to be thinking about for our public transport services. So to me, to really optimise patronage, to optimise the limited dollars that we have, uh, and to reduce carbon emissions, we need to understand not only the total uh, patronage by route, but by time of day. Um, and, and that is how we're going to be able to make sure that we're matching our service and our costs and our carbon emissions to the demand. And I think that's the level of sophistication the operating model needs to get to. It's not the role of this committee to do that, but, but it is the role of this committee to make sure that that information is being provided and is being used to optimise the service delivery. And I think we're starting on that journey and some of this data coming through now uh, is clearly on the right path, but we've got a long way to go if we're really going to get best bang for buck um, and get the most people in buses um, and getting a fantastic service in terms of um, uh, patronage cost and carbon emissions. So those are the three imperatives from my point of view, and that's the sort of service standard that we need to be developing to. And I'm certainly from a governance point of view, looking for management to bring that sort of evidence forward that the data is being used to refine and optimize their service. And I think we're only at the start of that learning curve, um, but it's good to see it starting. Thanks. Thank you for those wise words. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, um, I concur, very wise words indeed. Um, no wonder you're a commissioner. Uh, look, I do have a few issues, um, if I may. The first is a couple of bouquets. Bus, bus refresh on the face of it appears to uh, be starting to look quite positive. Uh, and certainly um, the data is certainly starting to uh, resemble, I think, what some, some of the committee members have been asking for. So well done to start. Uh, a few issues, if I may. Um, can someone remind me, please, briefly, 
about the scope of the Western Bay of Plenty Transport Systems Plan. Staff? I, I can make a, a comment on, on behalf of uh, our partners for the TSP. So the TSP, as my understanding, is the, the transport delivery plan uh, to give effect to, to UFTI. So the TSP contains uh, a wide range of both projects and uh, business cases that are going to be developed over the short, medium and long term. And most, if not all, of the activities that regional council are undertaking as set out in a later paper around strategic direction uh, where they pertain to Tolong and the Western Bay, they will be part of, of the transport system plan. So it is already starting to be implemented and delivered. And in my view, the TSP is going in the right direction by now having dedicated um, program management resource that is actually starting to drive forward not only the individual projects, but how they're all coordinated together, because that's actually the key to all of this, is when do we actually need to invest and what is the right priority order to invest? So, James, thank you for that. But why, why do we have um, the explanation that it's been deferred? So that's actually in relation to decisions made by Waka Kotahi as part of the uh, National Land Transport Programme. So in essence, the TSP and indeed UFTI have set out a medium scenario for investments in bus services. And all we're saying at the moment is for this NLTP period up to 2024, uh, there is no explicit provision at the moment to uh, deliver those service frequency increases. And one of the reasons for that is we need to do the business case work that I'll refer to later to actually make the case for investing in the right services at the right time. Now, it isn't to say we're not doing anything because you'll be aware we've already undertaken one refresh optimization process in the Western Bay and we'll be looking to progress the rest of the network as soon as we can. Uh, so in uh, answer or recognition, I should say, of um, the chair's comment at the start of the meeting, the key imperative for the next couple of years is to make absolute best use of our existing spend um, before uh, we undertake any additional uh, investment in either the services or the really big ticket infrastructure items. And all of that will come through either the public transport services and infrastructure business case or uh, various area business cases that are also being produced. Uh, thanks, James. I'm a person who, who needs pictures. Um, so when I just get an explanation that it's been deferred in toto, that's not quite the full story for me because we have got business cases um, occurring and work is, is being done. So it would be just useful uh, to have a perhaps a, a slightly clearer understanding of that for dimwits like myself. But anyway, uh, look, just a, another a couple of issues, if I may. Were any complaints received about the removal of the connection between the hospital and the mount? I can answer that without any reference to data. So I know there were some concerns expressed by a few people about the withdrawal of that connection. Uh, we were able to respond by pointing it out that for a lot of the journeys between um, the Mount and the hospital, even though there was a transfer in the CBD, which previously wasn't there for the hospital link, uh, the total journey time is actually still quicker than the previous hospital link, which took a very uh, circuitous route down the mound. Now, we are well aware that there are continuing concerns about the lack of that direct connection at the moment. It is certainly something we're looking to uh, explore again through the phase two refresh to see whether there is a case for uh, restoring that link. The challenge we had in the phase one refresh with a bus company were very nervous about very long routes, particularly going down Cameron Road through the CBD and then over the bridge because you're going through a lot of the main congestion points in Tauranga and the longer bus routes you have and the more congestion points you go through, um, the more unreliable the service tends to be and that's where the bus company were perhaps understandably coming from. But look, it is an issue that we are well aware of and we're certainly looking to try and address that in the next refresh process. 
And Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, just a couple of other points. One, poor old Wilkin Bay, uh, not looking too good on the, the stats around um, punctuality and reliability, et cetera. But uh, the Wednesday challenge, if, if I read the budget forecast correct, is that looking like it's going to uh, blow out? Uh, through the chair, I'm not aware that that is the case. I mean, there is a fixed amount of money um, for the Wednesday challenge, which has been agreed by the three partners through their respective financial processes. So I'm certainly not aware of any uh, overspend issues. And I think we've all been pretty clear as funding partners that the money is what is available. And uh, if there are any overspend issues, the uh, cloth will have to be cut accordingly. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mees. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about the, um, the hospital link um, and the discontinuation of that. On page 28 of our agenda, there's a, um, a graph which shows a hospital link in 55 um, change and there's a significant drop there in patronage um, so is that only um, uh, attributable to the stopping that uh, route going from the CBD through to the hospital or has there been um, another route picked up on some of those those people because it's a bit hard to tell from, from the graph um, but if, if um, if it is just because we've not continued the link through, um, I'd like to ask our representatives on the Joint Tarrant of Public Transport Committee to discuss this, because my understanding was that one of the reasons for discontinuing it at this stage was the, uh, the roadworks on Cameron Road and the added congestion that this was likely to cause. So it was going to be um, quite a ponderous uh, route uh, for the buses to take with diversions and what have you. Um, so I, it, it would be a good topic to discuss um, at that joint committee because um, that committee will have a much better understanding about the programme for the Cameron Road project and when it would be feasible to get that route back on track again um, because personally I would quite like that to be done as soon as possible. So. Can staff comment on the reduction um, in the trips on um, Hospital Link in 55 is, is my first query. On page uh, five of the, of the Arataki report or 28 of our agenda. So are you referring to Appendix 3 in the table which shows the different routes and yes. the, um, uh, the patronage across those? Yes, routes change November 20th, yeah. I'm refreshed. Yeah. Sorry, uh, did you want to answer that one? Well, I think um, on page 28, the bar chart that shows before and after um, impacts in a way, or sure. rather the year-on-year uh, -year impact for the affected routes, I think it may be a bit misleading in that it doesn't show a journey analysis for the people that would have caught the HL previously you know what are they doing now they, they're clearly having to get off the 55 and uh, jump on another bus and this may not be teasing that out so that that journey analysis um, is probably going to form part of our review of um, the network changes once we've got a wider data set uh, but yes unfortunately that chart doesn't quite show the second leg of that new journey no, that's right there's 23,000 people dropped off the radar um presumably they're still catching the bus um, but doing it in a different way um, okay yes. well, thank you for that but you know if it could be discussed at the joint committee I would appreciate that um, my other um, two issues are with regard to our uh, punctuality um, our uh, uh, service delivery um, we've got quite a few routes that are operating at a, um, only about a seven percent um, uh, punctuality. Do we have a KPI for what is acceptable? I know we've got performance standards with our contractors, um, and if they um, don't hit 
performance standards and then our penalties. But um, is, is punctuality, do we have KPIs, what is acceptable and what isn't? James? Uh, yes, we do. Um, those are analysed by our service planning uh, colleagues within regional councils. So we can uh, usually work out whether uh, any month of data is uh, above or below the line. My recollection from meetings I've had with those colleagues is that generally punctuality is within the service standards that we set. Uh, it might be that the service standards need to be reviewed as part of any uh, future changes to contract to perhaps better reflect the uh, the aspiration we have to um, improve uh, punctuality. So generally speaking, we think we're in within target, um, but it's the targets that actually might need to be reviewed. One of the key things I think we need, though, is to have that really good bus priority in place because it's very difficult in a contract situation to uh, penalise bus companies when they can turn around and say, well, sorry, regional council, but because of the congestion situation, which is not something that we can control, it's very difficult uh, for you to uh, beat us over the head and say that we're, we're not performing. So my view on this situation is that as part of this business case and the service planning work going forward, we need to have a good review of what is an appropriate target based on the conditions we currently face and based on the aspiration to improve bus priority. So there is no excuse if buses are able to get through congestion, either through bus lanes or priority at signals, then it makes it much easier uh, to then have a performance regime that we can uh, use through the contract. Thank, thank you, I, um, and I totally agree. We need to relook at that. Um, it's good to have that point reinforced because when one in four trips um, doesn't run to time or doesn't turn up, um, we've not got much of a chance of getting people um, making public transport their option of choice. Yeah. Um, so my last comment is on um, with regard to the tertiary commuter services um, on page 13 of the report, um, page 36 of our agenda, the subsidy uh, for those um, per customer on the tertiary routes is very high um, and it almost looks unsustainable. So my question is at what point are we going to review these? Um, because just, just looking at the, um, the cost um, per uh, subsidy by Waka Kotahi and the local share are very, very high. Um, so what, what is our plan to review these? Uh, our plan is to review when we're in a position to understand what we would like to provide by way of a, a future contract. So I think one of the key questions we need to ask ourselves, perhaps starting in the regional public transport plan, is what do we want the future of travel between the main urban centres to, to look like? So at the moment, we have a small number of relatively infrequent routes that go between the three urban centres. And one feeling that I have is that that relatively low level of service isn't actually encouraging many people to travel. So therefore, uh, we have a high subsidy because there is a big fixed cost even to providing uh, one service so part of me thinks that what we probably need to be doing is asking ourselves what would be a more attractive service in the future which yes would require more buses and more cost um, but would it actually then enable many more people to use the service uh, pay a fare which would at the very least ensure there was no uh, increase in overall subsidy because you're absolutely right the figures are are fairly alarming in terms of how much we are paying for that relatively small number of people so for me we have an opportunity i think in the bay of plenty because we have three urban centers fakatani rotorua and tauranga and um, plus some other centers like kadikati tipuki which actually people do travel 
uh, between on a regular uh, basis. It's not like a Targo or somewhere like that where it's four and a half hours to get from Dunedin to Queenstown. We actually have quite a lot of places on the way on routes that we could actually connect. Um, so for me, one of the priorities is to have um, a better plan perhaps around our inter-urban services and make them really fit for purpose for a whole range of uh, travel and not just tertiary because at the moment the tertiary is uh, for a fixed purpose we actually want to expand out those user classes to other people uh, mr thomas uh, <clears throat> thank you chair um james music to my ears you're talking about the interregional travel there i think um that that's something our community is looking for um we've got you know quite a spread outside of Rotorua. <clears throat> um, I've just got a, um, a, a comment and a question. Um, firstly, a comment around the dip for Waikato in November on your graph. Um, that may have been because they were in a, in a very widespread lockdown through through November that had, that had come in with Delta, I think it was. Um, and also just a comment on the drop-off in traffic and, and punctuality along um, Tinai Road, the the work on the roundabout there was incredibly disrupting. I drive in through there every time and it was putting, um, you know, half as long again on my trips in. And we also had the same thing from Nongataha as well, um, the roundabout being put in there. I just had a question um, and it was sad to see that Waka Katohi, um hasn't supported the balanced approach um, um, system that, that was recommended for Rotorua. Um, I do understand that, you know, it was a very hurried consultation, but, you know, we are in a fairly desperate state, state in Rotorua with the very low numbers of people using public transport there now, and we do need to be brave and do something new. Um, I just wondered that lack of funding for that, has that had, he, had any impact on the... Um, investigation going on now into um, doing some new routes, you know, within our existing budget, trying to do a refresh within the existing budget. And have you got an update on that? We were looking to bring that back to this committee um, fairly soon. So I just wondered where we are on that. Yes, through the chair, I can certainly provide an update. So in answer to your first question, no. Uh, any Waka Kotahi funding decisions through the NLTP around the balanced approach haven't affected the refresh process because, as you rightly point out, that is within existing budgets. And our view is that we could probably provide quite a lot of the benefits of the balanced approach within the existing refresh process, not absolutely everything. Um, but certainly we think we can make the system work a lot better within uh, the existing uh, resources, which includes uh, a much more um, sensible um, routing pattern around the CBD so that there's much better access to some of the main uh, destinations such as the, the Central Mall and now, of course, the um, uh, the waterfront with all the good stuff going on down there so we're actually pretty excited that we can deliver quite a lot of the balanced approach without any additional um, uh, funding for the services um, the infrastructure particularly the bus stops is more of a challenge because um, the work that we've been doing down with um, colleagues in Rotorua has identified a number of locations particularly around the CBD uh, where new bus stops would be a really good idea in order to be able to um, provide better access, again, for particularly for people with mobility impairments, as we've heard earlier. So the challenge we have there is that whilst there is some funding for various categories in the National Land Transport Programme, it isn't explicitly um, for bus stops in the CBD. Um, so what we are doing is working closely with Waka Kotahi colleagues to see whether there is funding in the current NLTP for Rotorua that can be repurposed with everyone's agreement um, to actually de to deliver those infrastructure improvements, which would really support the service changes uh, that we would like to make. And then in answer to your last question in terms of timescales, so we are pleased to report that we are 
continuing with the uh, proposed public consultation, which was approved at the last meeting back in November. So at the moment, the likely launch date for that is around the 11th of, of April, which will give us enough time to do the consultation and then report back the findings to the next committee on the 23rd of, of June. Now with uh, COVID, of course, um, uh, ideally we'd be going down there and having lots of face-to-face -face discussions with folks and doing all that sort of stuff, which was really effective in the Tauranga refresh. Unfortunately, because of Omicron, we're gonna to have to pare back what we do on the face-to-face -face side of things and do most of the consultation uh, digitally uh, if, we, uh, if we can. Um, so it's not ideal, um, but we'll do what we possibly can to make sure everyone is aware of it. If people can spread the word um, that we want as many people as possible to, to respond to the consultation and provide input because it really does make our job then a lot easier to sell these uh, changes to the, uh, the decision makers um, further up the chain. Um, thanks for that. And I, I, when we're doing the consultation, I think it's vital, especially in Rotorua, that we find a way to reach out to the people who aren't using public transport at the moment. You know, we get fairly favourable favorable reviews from the people who are using it. It's just trying to expand that, that group of users is our issue. Absolutely. Thanks very much for that. You're very welcome. All right, that seems to be the end of the discussion on the Arateki report. I'm happy to move the recommendation on page 20 that we receive the report and it's been seconded by Mayor Weber. Uh, any discussion? I'll put the motion. All in favour, please say aye. Hands up. We have uh, everybody's hands up that I can see. All in favour, against? Uh, carried. Thank you. Well done. We move now to page... Um, Page, page 50 of uh, actually page 49 of the report strategic direction 2022 and that's going to be hit by oh James yep sorry it's me again and because we've already discussed quite a few of these um, projects in the meeting already I'm not going to go through the reports in any uh, great detail but I just do want to highlight a couple of other things that perhaps we haven't discussed very much um, so far. So uh, priority work uh, for the committee in uh, 2022 really does start with the Regional Public Transport Plan, which um, in my view has made really good progress um, in no small uh, manner, thanks to the really great engagement we've had through the councillor uh, workshops, which I think have added significant value. We've been really, really grateful as staff for the the constructive um, input we've had from, from everyone into those. And it's going to make the document that we're currently um, producing a lot more robust uh, when we go out to, to public consultation. So um, the RPTP, we're going to have another workshop um, before the next uh, committee meeting. And then we're looking to go live with the public consultation following uh, the 23rd of June or soon after then. Uh, I've already mentioned the public transport services and infrastructure business case. So we're in the process now of getting the uh, request for proposal from consultants to, to start that work. And that is going to give effect to uh, the TSP and, and UFTI and is critical for the next uh, regional land transport plan and also the national land transport plan. So we've got um, a window of time now to really get this right and make sure that we identify the right investment in both services and infrastructure in the right places at the right time and ensure that is all integrated with the, uh, the spatial planning that's going on uh, across uh, the uh, Western Bay region. That's absolutely critical. Um, I've already mentioned the refreshes. So we have Rotorua, um, also, Eastern Bay, we are looking to um, progress a refresh in that part of the world. And in the next report on improving our network, uh, I do make reference to uh, the proposal to make some changes to Route 122. So we can perhaps discuss that then. Um, the Western Bay Phase 2 refresh is also really critical because following the success of Phase 1, 
we believe there are some really good opportunities again to look at the routes we're providing and make some changes that are actually really going to benefit um, passengers. We've got some quite interesting ideas and what we'd like to be able to do, if that is possible, is share some of those ideas uh, in a workshop setting before we go uh, live to the public in any consultation uh, process because as with any change there are going to be um, winners and some losers and the challenge we always have is to make sure the winners are much greater in number than the losers and that the losers don't get so uh, adversely impacted that their lives are made a lot more difficult so we're really keen to try and test some ideas with um, councillors to see how uh, they feel uh, about them. Uh, in terms of other work, very briefly, um, some real key priorities are around getting bus decarbonisation uh, really going because we're now starting to um, look forward to new contracts in Rotorua, Eastern Bay, and then subsequently uh, Tauranga and making a decision about uh, what sort of buses we are going to be procuring uh, in those contracts um, is actually something that's going to start fairly soon. Uh, particularly in Rotorua. Uh, so that's a really key uh, piece of work, understanding what needs to be done in bus decarbonisation. And also last and by no means least, we have some work going on to examine the opportunities for a ferry service from Amokarela to Tauranga CBD and then to the Mount. Uh, you may well be aware that the Wednesday Challenge have been um, promoting a short-term uh, trial service um, to see whether there is um, uh, sufficient uptake to uh, make uh, any permanent solution something that is um, more feasible from a financial and economic perspective. So it'll be very interesting to see how that trial uh, operates. But in the meantime, we're engaging a subject matter expert to review all the existing information that we have, particularly through Priority One, uh, and also some work that Fuller's were doing a few years ago to examine uh, the, uh, the pros and cons of a ferry option, and in particular to understand what level of patronage would be needed um, to make such a service viable. One of the early pieces of advice we've had from that subject matter expert is that you need to spread your demand over a lot of the day, not just in the peaks, because if you only have peak demand, and very low off-peak demand, you've got a huge and expensive asset such as a boat um, that's actually uh, uh, not, bit, not able to cover its costs. So that's something that we will be exploring in more detail uh, in the short term. Um, in terms of other, uh, other things on the agenda, um, probably just worth mentioning briefly, travel demand management behavior change, that work is ongoing. It is broadly concluded in Rotorua and Eastern Bay, and we'll be reporting back to the next committee on the conclusions of that work, and it's just about to kick off in uh, Western Bay. So we're very pleased with how that's been going. And if there are any opportunities for funding for those measures through the forthcoming emissions reduction plan, then we're actually in quite a good position to be able to go to government and say there are some things here that we can actually get on and do if you provide us with the funding and the backing uh, to do so. so. That's really all I want to say on the uh, strategic direction for 2022. It's a, yep. uh, a big programme, it's an ambitious programme, but we're really happy. We're in a good space moving forward. We've got a couple of questions from first uh, Mayor Weber, followed by Commissioner Selwood. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wonder if we've a bunch of mice about to jump on the treadmill once again for this three-year exercise. And I go to the mid midpoint of your third paragraph. This work will set out the 10-year investment strategy to deliver. And I'm just a little concerned that doing the same thing time after time and expecting different results, um, we, we're going to be a case study for that. What is the process you, we're going to put in place? And I'm mindful of Councillor Thompson's point before. We can come up with all sorts of great ideas, but if the regional council doesn't say we're going to fund it, if the individual councils don't say they're going to fund it, if NZTA say they're not going to fund it, then why not just cross out the date of the current one and, and save all the executive and governance time? Of you know, Because if you're not going to get the commitment for funding, you've got to ask the question, why are we even doing this? 
have we got that commitment from the players yet? Well, through the chair, I think we absolutely have because all the work that's been done through UFTI and the transport system plan is uh, a collaboration between the uh, local councils, the regional council and Waka Kotahi. You know, we're all um, committed to making the TSP in the Western Bay a real success. And similarly in Rotorua and Whakatane, you know, we're using the regional land transport plan to identify those, those key priorities. Now, the big challenge with all of this is, as we know, levels of uh, funding, which always outstrip the the aspirations that uh, uh, that we have. I don't think I've ever worked in a situation where we've had uh, too much funding uh, and not enough activities uh, to take advantage of that funding. So that really means it's key to get a good business case process in place and good prioritisation and focus on what we need to deliver, particularly, as I said earlier, to support spatial planning and, and development and to make sure that these uh, future communities that we're building are actually well served uh, with walking, cycling, public transport from the start. Well, sorry, Mr. Chair, supplementary comment. Uh, spatial planning is way outside the scope of this group. We're focusing on the public transport element of it. And I know I wasn't the best student at school, but I've read a lot of LTPs and I still can't see any line item for the capital purchase of park and rides, which is a fundamental underpinning part of shifting people from cars to buses. It's in nobody's LTP. So, you know, I, I, I may be not good at reading, but somebody might want to point me out where I'm missing the point. Thank you. Any staff response? Yeah, through the chair, park and ride is certainly something that will be examined through the business case process. But one of the key requirements for park and ride is a constriction of supply of plentiful and free parking in the destinations uh, that the park and ride service will actually serve. So park and ride works really well in places like Oxford in the UK where there is so little parking available because of the historic nature of the city and the parking that is available, you'd need to remortgage a kidney to afford it. Um, what we've got to ask ourselves in somewhere like Tauranga is, are we really committed to reducing levels of uh, parking and charging for parking in those key destinations, such as the CBD, uh, the Mount, where park and ride really could um, make a difference because they are key uh, generators of of travel but park and ride doesn't work if there's already lots and lots of free parking at the destination yeah mr chair my final comment i can take i can show you reports from this committee going back to 2004 we have done business case after business case after business case we fail to actually do it and I wonder why in, in sort of 18 years, we are going to have a significant, you know, light bulb moment to say, yes, we're going to do it. Stop talking about it if we're not going to do it. Thank you. Commissioner Selwood, your points are noted again, Mayor Weber. Thank you. I think we all share Mayor Weber's frustration of the disconnect between desire and actual delivery. But um, the comment I wanted to raise is really related to the table on page 53, and in particular, the public transport services infrastructure business case. And it goes back to my earlier point um, that this business case is developing a plan uh, for prioritising our 10-year service and infrastructure investment strategy. And it really does need to be informed by the sort of analysis that I described earlier. Um, and I see in our next agenda item, the transport management system data um, program is on track uh, for implementation around June this year. Um, and the technical work for our um, business cases are due to be 
completed by September with the complete business case by presumably and hopefully early 2023. So my question is whether or not the data analysis that I was speaking of earlier would be available in time to be able to input into the public transport services and infrastructure business case so that we can have a highly robust investment plan that maybe we can implement and will make a difference. Yeah, through the chair, the um, availability of, of data through either the B card system or the Dynamis real time information system is already quite significant. The challenge we have is being able to get that data into a format that we can actually analyze. And that's a key part of uh, the transport data system work that's that's currently underway. You know, we could supply hundreds of pages of raw uh, data from the system, um, but that's no use to anyone unless there's a way of analyzing it to be able to provide the, uh, the information uh, that's actually required for those uh, business cases and investment decisions. But I can certainly provide reassurance that from my perspective, this business case will use all uh, the available uh, data. And it's very sensible in my view to take our time to make sure we are using uh, the right data in a robust way uh, so that when we go to Waka Kotahi with our plan, um, they will find it much more difficult to pick holes in it and say that actually your analysis isn't robust enough because we are going to be in a situation uh, where we're going to be competing with a lot of other parts of uh, New Zealand for, for funding. So we have to make sure that our investment proposal is as robust as possible with the data we have available. Thanks, James. And I think that's exactly my point. Um, you know, if it, if it requires more resourcing, then let's invest the resourcing uh, to enable this to occur because that will create a more robust business case and it will uh, improve our ability to get funding for in investment. So um, if there are issues around staffing, then perhaps we need to make recommendations through to the council um, as a whole on making sure that we've got the right resourcing for this because it's mission critical really. All right. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, James, I'm, I'm, I was listening into the discussion around park and ride and, and the need to have, um, you know, <laughs> an incentive to use it rather than being able to park in the t in, in the middle of town um being a, you know that's never going to be the case in Rotorua we've we've got um you know all, so much parking available that that it's not something we're really going to be able to restrict but i wonder if you see park and ride being um a feasibility for Rotorua if it was around the outskirts you know we have a lot of interregional travel into Rotorua. We have a lot of people living in Tauranga but working in Rotorua, um, people coming up from Whakatane, coming in from the south. Um, and so I just wondered if, if you know, like as, a, as an alternative to that interregional public transport is park and ride around the outskirts of Rotorua an, an option? Do you see it as an option at any stage in, in the you know, the coming 10 years or so, or is it a, a just not a runner? Well, um, I'm not going to definitively rule it in or out, but my te technical advice would be anywhere that struggles to um, restrict the supply and price of parking is going to struggle to make park and ride really work. And so if I was going from... Tauranga to Rotoru and got to the outskirts and I knew that I had a parking space available for free, I'm not going to get off onto a bus for that last bit of the journey because I'm nearly there. So that's the kind of reality we're, we're dealing with. So I think we just have to, yeah, you're absolutely right, ask ourselves seriously, is this an option for now? 
Um, or are we better to actually focus our intention investment on other things that we do believe will make a difference? Yeah, thank you. And I, and, and, um, I think I'm kind of in an agreement with you, and I think that actually just puts more emphasis on the need to look at that interregional public transport. Um, you know, I think we'd really love to see that here in Rotorua. I know my community out towards Whakatane would be really keen on the ability to use public transport to get into town. But anyhow, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, are there any further questions of James? There have been none on page, do, 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 sorry, what page are we? Uh, page 50, there is um, two recommendations, uh, receives the report and endorses the Public Transport Committee Work Programme for 2022. Do we have a mover? Moved by Councillor Neves, seconded by Mr Thomas. Is there any discussion further on that, those two uh, recommendations? There being none, all in favour, please say aye. Against, carry. Thank you. James, on to the last one. Last improving and certainly by no means least. Improving our network. Yep, thanks. This is hopefully a relatively simple report, which only has two items. And the second of those, the transport management system roadmap, we've already discussed quite uh, significantly throughout this agenda. Um, but I will make the point that one of the things we are looking to do through this process is not only to use um, good data to make solid investment decisions, but it's also to um, provide stakeholders, customers, anyone interested in the transport system with the ability to um, find the data that they want and need and actually self-serve through some kind of web-based uh, dashboard process. That's what we're ideally looking to do so that we can have you know, a really good set of open source data that people can uh, interrogate for their particular uh, purposes um, we're, we, we'd like to get away from just presenting stuff to people uh, and uh, because inevitably whatever we present, someone will have uh, another uh, request or desire that we, we haven't thought about. But if we have the data available for people uh, to self-serve, then they can actually um, uh, undertake those queries themselves. So that's what we're aiming um, to do. Um, in terms of the other aspect then of the Improving a Network report, we already discussed very briefly when colleagues from Eastern Bay were here around some potential short-term uh, changes to the Service 122 from Ahope uh, to Whakatane. Uh, in essence, at the moment, the service um, comes in from Ahope and then does a huge loop of uh, Whakatane before uh, terminating in uh, the CBD, and the challenge with that is that it means that for people coming in from a Hopi, um, they have a very long diversion before getting to their destination in the CBD. Um, the other challenge we have is that the one two two doesn't serve uh, the hub, which is a major retail destination, and um, the uh, location has recently benefited from uh, new bus stops. Um, so it would be really great if more buses could actually serve those stops. So the thinking behind the proposed change is to essentially run the 122 uh, from a Hopi, uh, then going through town to, uh, sorry, then going direct to the CBD firstly, and then out to the hub, essentially. So it's a much quicker journey into the CBD. Uh, the route would actually go the same way in both directions so that people living between the CBD and the hub would have the option to go on the bus in, in either direction to those two locations, rather than having a loop at the moment, which means a lot of people can only go uh, to the CBD in one direction, and it's actually quite a circuitous uh, business to do that. So essentially, that's the, uh, the rationale for the change. And as Mayor Turner alluded to um, staff uh, recently met with officers and uh, councillors to discuss the changes and I think on the whole they were well received so what we're really asking for at this stage is for um, 
um, permission, if we like, to continue that work and actually go to a resolution and hopefully get things um, delivered. Because as people have rightly said, uh, delivering stuff is really what we, we should be about. So this is an opportunity to uh, hopefully do something positive for the, um, the passengers in uh, Fakatani. Thank you for that, James. Before I go to Councillor Thompson, can I just say that this is where um, B card data is really important because it actually not only tells you where people get on, but where they get off. And so you can see if you're reading the data right, you'll be able to ascertain uh, whether you should be going direct to the CBD or not, and vice versa. So um, the this to me is what the data is all about and, and your ability to make good service. Uh, decisions. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the question is really around the new transport data systems team. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it relates to another question around the proprietorial nature uh, of any um, uh, system that's actually produced. So, for example, does the, does the team comprise representation from MOT, who of course will be responsible for driving a lot of uh, policy coming up? Uh, are we partnering with the councils? Just, just who exactly makes up the team? Mm -hmm. And uh, will this be a proprietorial system uh, for the regional council or for whom? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Through the chair, I'll endeavour to answer that as best I can, but Simon Bell, the team leader, will hopefully be able to <clears throat> provide more information if necessary. So the team is a regional council team. It's a very new team. So Simon uh, originally was a, a data analyst within the previous public transport operations team. But because data is such a huge part of everything we do, uh, we decided to effectively create a new transport data systems team of which Simon is, is the leader. So we have Simon and three other staff who all started at the beginning of uh, this uh, calendar year. So at the moment, the, um, the work that we're focusing on is developing a roadmap to answer the very sorts of questions that you've um, posed. So I think, unless Simon can correct me, the short answer is that we're still working through uh, the details as to exactly what uh, system we will use. We know, for example, that um, our colleagues in regional council and the operational performance team use Power BI, which is a, a well-known off-the-shelf system, and they actually produce some quite good um, performance material for uh, reporting against our KPIs through the long-term plan. Um, but what we want to ideally do, as I said earlier, is find a system that's going to enable users to be able to find the data they want in a, an easy to understand form and that's one of the things we need to work through what is the best way of doing that i'm pretty sure there must be an off-the-shelf solution i'm pretty confident we don't want to be uh, designing our own but um, simon might be able to provide more details on that i mean answer to a question about uh, other organizations yeah it's a huge part of our role to work with the likes of mot waka kotahi and uh, the councils um, to be able to understand each other's data needs and ensure those are uh, acted upon as, as prompt as possible. So although we're not one um, homogenous team across all those organisations, we all have really good data people that talk to each other on a regular basis as only they can. And so we're pretty confident that we're making uh, all the connections we, we need to through this process. But Simon, I don't know if you want to add any more to what I've said. I'd only preface um, the the roadmap piece that that's very much internally focused that like uh, mm -hmm. a sort of three year horizon for the team and how we can get to where we want to be. Um, we're fact finding at the moment um, and we're engaging with various stakeholders. So that'll steer the direction of the team. And the only other thing I'd say is how we define systems. So we've got a bunch of very uh, disjointed data sets and the system may just be the people and a, an off-the-shelf tool in the middle to connect them all internally. So, yeah, I don't. We don't know what that system is going to look like. Um, our primary focus is to deliver a, a really good service to consumers. So that's all around operational management and um, making sure schedule adherence, missed trips reporting, and um, contract 
management is, is facilitated as well. So that, that's our key focus. And falling out of that is obviously data to inform decision making. Except my only comment on that would be in relation to Commissioner Selwood's earlier question about having the appropriate data to inform the um, upcoming business case. Um, and you've just mentioned a three-year horizon. Um, I hope we're not seeing a disconnect there, please. Oh, through the chat. No, uh, certainly not. No, that's uh, an internal team horizon, if you will. Um, we'll have immediate benefits occurring just by the virtue of having two other business analysts and a support person. So, yeah, we'll, we'll work with James' te James's team to understand their needs. Uh, we've got really huge data sets and it's all around how can we present that in a way that facilitates the decision making you're talking about. So that, that work progresses apace. Um, there are a few projects that are going to be landed quite soon, but that's all internally focused to underpin James's team's work. So there may not be a huge amount of visibility outside council, but it'll come through in recommendations and so on. Thank you. I've got Mayor Weber followed by Councillor Mees. Yeah, following on from Councillor Thompson's comments and, Councillor, uh, and Commissioner Selwood's earlier ones, in this day and age of software as a service, I hope like hell we're not reinventing a wheel um, here. We should be able to get something, you know, you, if you went out with a very wide sense, what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve? Re request for information. You might be surprised that anything from pre other regional councils in New Zealand won't even cut the mustard. So I think you really need to start from square one and go outside. These systems are available off the shelf. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Councillor Needs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a query about the proposals for the um, changes to the Whakatane service. James, you said that um, you discussed this with Whakatane um, District Council. I'm a little surprised um, when I actually compare the route to the map um, of Whakatane that um, the route's not going anywhere near the visitor centre. Um, that that um, top part of the route up Kakaharoa Drive yeah. it was the part of the route that actually went to the visitor centre and, and I guess along to the regional council where quite a few people work mm. and um, the wharves there. So was the rationale for discontinuing it um, at the, the roundabout which is sort of halfway along the, the city, the shopping centre, is that because people weren't using it or was it um, convoluted or was it taking too long? What, what yeah, was it is It is very much the, the, the latter. If we're looking to deliver a route within existing resources, there's only so much time it can take before you need another bus. So inevitably what you need to do is look at the trade-off between the need to get as much coverage as you can across the urban area with the need to ensure that you have a service that you can operate with with one vehicle which is essentially what we're we're talking about here so in the report we do identify that um, one of the cons of this proposal is that it would no longer serve uh, the key street stop in uh, the CVD and analysis suggests that it isn't that uh, well used but clearly for the people who do use it then there is a disbenefit if it's no longer served so what we will have to do before we firm up the proposal is uh, look at that data and ask ourselves whether we think there are enough people who are going to benefit from this versus those who uh, unfortunately may see a, um, a reduction in benefit. We've also identified another couple of sections of route in Fakatane where the bus would would no longer uh, traverse. So it is, is something that needs to be worked through, and we need to come to a final decision between the uh, the stakeholders as whether we actually go for this uh, or or not. So we'll come back to the next meeting essentially with a a view as to whether we think this is something that's worth. Uh, doing because there are wider benefits, particularly accessing uh, the hub. Because that's quite a new section of route, quite a long section of route, and therefore the saving has to come from somewhere else. 
these things. Um, I'm just very conscious of um, visitors and um, I'm wondering, are you going to go out and consult with, um, you know, the visitor set, for example, um, uh, to, to see what their uh, perception is? And are we consulting with the general public? We will be doing a consultation because any, any change like this, um, just introducing it without telling anyone is doesn't usually go down very well so um yeah we will be doing some consultation the exact scope of that i think we can discuss and agree but it does seem like a very sensible approach to be engaging with um key stakeholders such as the um uh, the visitor center certainly our experience in rotorua is that um we've had really really positive interactions with not only the the eyesight but with the central uh, mall the airport uh, in rotorua everyone seems to want the public transport system to do better it really is very very uh, good to see and hopefully we'll have similar uh, discussions with colleagues in in Fakatane. All right, that seems to be the end of the discussion and we've moved into a, it's probably taken an hour longer than we thought, but that's okay. Um, all good discussion. Uh, can we, on page 57, there is uh, recommendations to receive the report. Do I have a mover? Moved by Mayor Weber, seconded by Mr Thomas. All in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Thank you for your participation. Is there any further uh, anything further that, that I've missed, James or Matt? No, Mr. Chair. For this meeting? That's the full no. agenda. That's thank you very much. It. Okay, so, you know, thank you for your time. It, it's, um, you know, it's a big, big portion out of your day. So we do appreciate you taking the time to take this seriously. As, as I said at the start, um, our regional council, PT, is a is a very big budget item on our council, and it's and it's moved a hell of a long way in the last five years. Um, so we shouldn't take it lightly. Um, and, but thank you for for giving it so much consideration today, and thank you to for staff for uh, stepping up at, with the data. We've got, as uh, Commissioner Selwood said, we've still got further to go. Time and the time of day is is another one. You've given us that very good appendix um, on the routes in total, um, but we look forward to, to even more details. So uh, good luck, Simon, with uh, your new role, because there's a lot going to rest on you if we're going to make good decisions. Thank you.